Welcome to Matter. I am Stephen Collins. I'm the CEO of Matter. Uh, really excited about uh, today. I'm going to give you two minutes on Matter and a little bit about the origin of this program and then uh, turn it over to people who will be more interesting uh, than I am. Uh, but let me tell you a little bit about Matter for those of you who don't spend as much time here as, uh, as I do. Um, so our core thesis around innovation in healthcare is rooted in collaboration. And we believe that by bringing together entrepreneurs and investors and doctors and scientists and executives from big companies, that that is the best way to develop solutions that will solve the most meaningful healthcare problems and do it in the right ways so that those solutions can ultimately be adopted and spread and be uh, affect the kind of change that the innovators uh, want to uh, accomplish in the world. Um, we really do three things uh, four and a half years into this journey. Um, we incubate startups. We have about 230 member companies. Uh, collectively, they've raised a little north than a billion dollars to fuel their growth. They range from very early stage companies working on product market fit to later stage startups with 100 people who've raised tens of millions of dollars of capital. And increasingly, they're all over the world. And they can plug in virtually to what we do. And they are a mix of software, medical device, pharmaceutical companies. Uh, we have a curriculum for them. We have mentoring programs. We help them raise money. We help them with everything from ideation all the way through to scaling in the market. Um, second thing we do is we provide innovation services to large companies, which engages them, brings them here. Uh, we help them source and co-develop solutions, often with our entrepreneurs. We help them tackle complex challenges, and we help them with organizational transformation as they try to become more entrepreneurial organizations and entities uh, themselves. We have about 60 partners, uh, mostly in the Chicago area, but increasingly all over the country and around the world. And the third thing we do is we're a nexus for the healthcare community. And we believe very strongly in convening, in bringing people together to uh, be inspired by, educated by, um, around interesting topics in healthcare related to healthcare technology and healthcare innovation, and to meet and interact with each other. And that is really the premise of today. Uh, with a focus around artificial intelligence and neuroscience, we see a lot of activity from investors, from entrepreneurs, from payers, from providers, about how to harness data and harness AI in new ways to improve health and healthcare. There's a lot of activity in this arena and a huge amount of opportunity when it comes to neuroscience. So today we're going to look at a variety of examples of what's being developed, how it can be used in practice to improve treatment, diagnosis, uh, monitoring uh, of various conditions in uh, the field of, uh, of neuroscience. This uh, program really started with a conversation with Carl Kokendorfer who is at UI Health, and we were talking about doing something like this a while ago. And fast forward, uh, there was a committee and a group of organizers, including UIC, um, UIUC, Mayo Clinic, um, UI Health, and Matter. Are you leaving anyone out? I don't think so. Uh, that really worked over a number of months to put this together. Um, we have support from Anthem, so we'll hear from uh, Plamen Petrov uh, from Anthem, uh, one of our newer partners, and we've been excited to get to know uh, the folks at Anthem and work with them. Um, and so with that, I want to introduce the Vice Chancellor for Innovation at the University of Illinois at Chicago, T.J. Augustine. Um, he is a chemist. He did his PhD at uh, Stanford, spent time at the Department of Energy, spent time in the Senate uh, doing all sorts of good things, then was at the University of Illinois System uh, for a little while, and now oversees innovation for UIC, which among other things means that he has responsibility for commercialization efforts and for entrepreneurship efforts uh, within the university. So. Uh, thanks for your collaboration. UIC has been a partner of Matter since we opened, and we very much appreciate that. We appreciate all the things that we've done together and appreciate this collaboration as well. Thank you.
morning, everybody. Uh, thank you all for being here, and thanks, Steve, for the, the nice intro. Um, as Steve said, my name is TJ Augustine. I'm the Vice Chancellor for Innovation at UIC. Um, just to start quickly, I want to thank, as, as Steve mentioned, Carl Kokendorfer, who helped to organize this, uh, one of our great physician scientists at, at the university. Um, and it's great to see the group that we've got uh, putting this event on today and here working together. Uh, uh, my organization, UIC, University of Illinois in Urbana-Champaign, which is once upon a time my alma mater and Mayo Clinic, a fantastic hospital and then research institution, also my wife's uh, medical, where my wife got my medical degree, so it's all in the family, which is always good. Um, and, and, and MATTER, which is, uh, you know, uh, as Steve said, the university's been a partner in MATTER from the beginning. Um, MATTER is just such an incredibly important part of Chicago's innovation community here. And this is just a great example of the kinds of things that MATTER does all the time, bringing together people who are leaders in emerging areas of technology like AI, bringing together leaders in healthcare, and bringing together people who know how to build uh, really successful businesses and getting them to talk to each other, to learn from each other, and ideally to work with each other, right? To create new products and services that, that ultimately change, uh, change people's lives. That's, that's really the point of all of this at the end of the day. And so I, I'm, I'm really excited to hear about what comes out of the conversations today and, and how you all work together going forward. Um, I want to take a few minutes just to talk about UIC. Uh, I worry sometimes UIC is the best kept secret in Chicago and I'm doing everything I can to change that. So um, I'll just take a few minutes to tell you about the university. So, so UIC is the city's only public research institution. Uh, it's the largest university in the city of Chicago. It's also the fastest growing university in the state, um, which is a pretty impressive uh, stat when you look at the fact that higher education has been going through a tough time, I would say, across the country over the last few years. And uh, Illinois has had some challenges when it relates to public financing. But, but UIC has really grown leaps and bounds. In the last five years, we've increased our student population 20%. And that's not because we decreased our, you know, the quality of our enrollees by any, by any stretch, but students are really voting with their feet. They're coming to UIC because they want to be in an exciting urban environment. Uh, UIC is just a you know, 20 or 30 minute walk from where we are here in the West Loop. Um, and, and they're coming because of the really uh, quality of academics and research at the university. So back to what we're working on here today at UIC, artificial intelligence has been an area that's been of great strength at the university for a long time. And a lot of the growth in the student body that I mentioned has been in the area of engineering and particularly computer science. It's growing so fast, in fact, we don't even have space, literally, we don't have space to put the faculty we're hiring and students were admitting. Um, and, and just a quick little note, our, our dean of engineering, Pete Nelson, opened the artificial intelligence laboratory at UIC more than 20 years ago, in 1990. So this has been an area where UIC has really been excelling for a long time. And the intersection with neuroscience and healthcare broadly also really hits another strength of UIC. Uh, just for another shout out, Jeff Loeb is somewhere, one of our fantastic uh, neuroscience uh, faculty at the university and other clinician scientists, just an example of the, the great work we do here. And um, UIC is really just a leader, uh, I would say, across the board in healthcare. With a, we have a, the UI Health System, which serves uh, the patient population on Chicago's west side and beyond, plus six self health science colleges, which are all really great examples of uh, scholarship and education. Um, and and th they are innovating at the intersection of AI in all sorts of different areas, whether it be in population health, developing new medical devices, or another one, therapeutics, an area that I'll, I'll talk about for just a second, where UIC has, has also had a lot of uh, history of success. We're one of the only universities in the world that has three drugs that we developed on, on the market right now. And um, we recently decided to partner with, a, with an organization called Deerfield Management, which is uh, basically a way for us to try and do more of that drug discovery work, but better, faster, and more of it. And the way AI is starting to intersect with that work is really exciting. Uh, it's allowing us to identify drug targets uh, more efficiently, develop molecules that go after those targets in a better way. And, and this sort of pains me as a chemist, but you're starting to see where you know, projects that would take a team of scientists slaving away in the lab, synthesizing molecules, AI is changing the way we start to look at that, and making that more efficient and easier to do. So uh, to sum that up, UIC's got a lot of strength in this area that, that you guys are talking about today. And I think it's a really exciting one that's got, a, got the potential to change uh, 
change the way we look at healthcare going forward. So with that, I want to thank you all again very much for being here. Thank you for everyone who put this event together. And I, again, I look forward to hearing all the great work that comes out of here. Thank you all very much. Good morning. Uh, thank you, everybody, for being here. Uh, my name is Arun Bhatia, Senior Program Director here at Matter. Uh, wanted to also welcome you and say thank you for spending the day with us. Uh, hopefully, this will be an exciting uh, and interesting day of learning. A uh, couple pieces of housekeeping that I just wanted to share and, and uh, maybe a couple of, of ground rules for today. There's always ground rules. Uh, so number one, we're going to try something a little bit different. For those of you that have been here before, you know we typically do Q&A after each session through what we call social QA. We're not going to do that this time. We're going to actually open it up uh, to all of you. We're going to hand out mics uh, to ask questions. So the ask of our speakers, uh, they've been asked to keep their comments and presentation uh, to an allotted, certain, uh, allotted amount of time and, and leave about five, 10 minutes for Q&A. Uh, what that means for you guys is we don't want people asking, you know, long essays or lectures of questions, so keep your questions concise. We will be floating around with mics. Please uh, hold them up to your, to your mouth really closely so we can all hear you. Uh, so we'll be doing that. Uh, I know folks usually ask about sessions like this, can they get access to slides? Uh, my, what I've encouraged each speaker is to put their contact info on their slides. Uh, please reach out to them directly if you want to access uh, or want a copy of their slides. Because uh, some information is proprietary, so I will leave it up to them uh, as far as what they would like to share. Uh, one other thing in terms of restrooms, uh, right out the elevator, men's is uh, that way, women's is that way. Uh, we'll have plenty of time during the day for breaks. There will be food, coffee, snacks across the hall, so please help yourself. Um, I think of me as your cruise director here for today, so as you go about during breaks, you are more than welcome to go see the space uh, and the wildlife out here with all of our entrepreneurs. They don't bite, uh, uh, and we encourage you to sit down with them and, uh, and, and say hello as well. Uh, with that, as Stephen mentioned just before we get to Plamen, um, one of the things that we do here is we do focus a lot on collaboration. And so in that spirit, I'm going to do something corny, but we're going to do it because collaboration is important. Uh, your goal today is to meet two new people. And so I'm going to make it easy for you. We're going to take the next one minute, just turn to the person next to you that you don't know, introduce yourself, and that's half of your job is done. <laughs> Go for it. <laughs> All right, so yeah, so I mentioned. So, uh, yeah, so uh, yeah, I've, uh, started my affiliate with UAC, started my PhD there in 1992. Oh, really? The first year, Pete, be the same year Pete became, became uh, faculty. faculty? Yeah. <laughs> Do you know Pete? Yeah, yeah he's yeah. my advisor. Oh, really? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, he's my really? PhD advisor. And, uh, and then, uh, um, so it's a long story, I uh, got all ABD, then I figured out I'm going to go do work, so I've been working, then I went back and reapplied and got my PhD uh, with, uh, with yeah, Hugo Boy, Pete Nelson, Hushank, uh, Piotr, uh, uh, yeah, and then um, I've, been, uh, I've been teaching in different, I'm teaching also, I'm faculty part-time at Northwestern as well. Uh, but at UIC, I pretty much teach every other semester. Oh, nice. And, and what do you teach when you're there? Uh, usually AI or NLP graduate classes, okay. natural language processing nice. AI. And it's a great hiring ground. I've hired about 15 people that are on my team right now. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's funny. So, so there's a, a concept that we've been kicking around. It's basically what you're doing, but we have a fancy name for it, which is professors of practice. Yeah. <laughs> All right. That's right. Yeah, we'll catch up. Let's uh, let's say uh, if you don't mind, I'd love to spend some time because we're doing Wonderful. research. And, uh, I'm, I'm taking off at 9:30, but we'll, we'll connect. See, now I can't get you to stop. Fantastic. All right, thank you so much. Thank you so much for that, guys. Appreciate it. Uh, and so, like I said, half of that job is already done. You'll have. Plenty of time throughout the day to, to fulfill the other half. That's going to be a lot more fun over drinks later as well. Uh, so hopefully, hopefully all of you got your programs out there. Uh, and uh, with that, I want to turn it over to 
Dr. Plamen Petrov from Anthem, thank you so much for uh, providing the morning keynote uh, today, and welcome. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Good morning. Uh, hopefully, you're uh, charged on coffee and uh, ready to go. Uh, so, uh, my name is Plamen Petrov. Uh, generally, you can see my, my role is uh, at Anthem uh, to bring AI and exponential technologies uh, uh, into, into the marketplace in the digital first uh, um, space, digital first care delivery space. And uh, I'll talk about that today from mostly from an AI point of view. Um, not necessarily, I, I will not go into our neuroscience future plans. Uh, I'll talk about what we currently have and uh, touch a little bit upon uh, the research uh, uh, that we're doing. I'm very excited uh, that we're a member of Matter. So it's a great place uh, where uh, we actually engage with uh, different startups, uh, um, get part of the ongoing educational program. We actually have uh, people that come and work here to get charged with the, with the energy. And uh, so let's get going here. If anybody has, uh, I know, questions, I'm open to answer quick questions in the middle. So feel free to inter interject. So. Uh, I'll very briefly, not a commercial, but uh, give you a sense of uh, what we've done at Anthem. Uh, uh, really, the goal here is to understand how uh, uh, AI really is transforming companies like Anthem. And we're investing heavily in R&D uh, in AI in order to, uh, to bring those new uh, capabilities, transformational ca capabilities to market. So uh, part of my uh, team, as you can see, I have, uh, I think this is my, yep, I have people a large uh, chunk of people here in Chicago, a lot of my development is here. Uh, I have uh, people in Boston, in Atlanta, and in Palo Alto, and we have a vibrant development center in, in Israel, in Tel Aviv. And uh, uh, we do a lot of partnerships, I'll talk a little bit about that, growing. Uh, some of them are actively, uh, uh, going actively, we're a sponsor of the Center for Deep Learning at Northwestern, uh, also we have research with several professors there, uh, and several labs. We, we're actively working with MIT. Uh, we are in discussions with uh, Mayo and uh, Illinois. Uh, Ravi is here somewhere. Uh, we're, uh, we have an active uh, work with Stanford. A lot of uh, some of our NLP is coming uh, in partnership from there and so forth. So um, the point I'm trying to make here is really um, research academic and uh, research uh, in AI uh, is becoming a core part of what companies do in order to be able to compete. And uh, we're, we're actively investing in doing that. Uh, so uh, artificial intelligence, the topic of the uh, discussion today, uh, well, it's not esoteric anymore. It's, uh, it's all around us. So we use it uh, every day. Uh, we use it when we cash in uh, uh, our checks. Uh, I, does anybody still go to a teller to cash in a check? I, I haven't done that for 10 years now. Uh, and there's a lot of AI there, right? There's uh, um, character recognition uh, uh, and text understanding. Uh, we use uh, maps, uh, uh, intelligent uh, mapping software to guide us where we go. Uh, we use uh, uh, machine learning uh, based uh, uh, translators between languages. Uh, we use uh, object uh, uh, image recognition and object detection. Uh, for in Facebook and in any different in in other environments, uh, we use uh, a Siri. Uh, I'm sorry, uh, Alexa and uh, voice rec voice recognition software to interact uh, with uh, computers. So all of that is there. How about in put some of that in healthcare? So that's kind of uh, the goal of what we're working on. Uh, the time is uh, uh, it's about time that uh, AI has matured to the point that it's uh, quite relevant and quite uh, uh, possible to have uh, uh, commercial implementations and uh, uh, clinical implementations of AI in practice. Uh, so I will touch just a little bit uh, of some of the research we're doing to give you a sense of, uh, uh, of what we do. Uh, and this is uh, part of the um, one to three year horizon. Uh, some of that is not in our products yet. Uh, we're actively involved with uh, different labs, as I mentioned, to get our pipeline ready. Uh, so we're actively involved uh, uh, in uh, uh, natural language processing and extracting uh, knowledge from, uh, uh, from uh, text and creating causal graphs. That w and uh, some of what I'll, what I'll talk about in the describing the product that we, we launched 
uh, just uh, this August is based on this research. Um, so really, the vast amount of uh, physician notes, encounter notes, uh, treasure trove of information, uh, frequently it is labeled data. We have the diagnosis. The, the physician has reviewed it, has put a diagnosis. Unfortunately, frequently that data is not readily available for computers to use. It needs to go through some advanced uh, NLP, and we're actively working in that space. Uh, with our, uh, our uh, partnership uh, at MIT, uh, we are actively working on uh, ambient sensing, uh, amazing technology, the ability to detect movement, to detect breathing uh, at that level of accuracy without any uh, uh, touch sensor, something that really detects uh, uh, via way uh, electrical signals. Uh, and uh, we're working also at... Uh, partnership with UIC, actually, uh, to uh, uh, detect uh, uh, problem, uh, heart disease problems uh, by uh, uh, using computer vision uh, and uh, image recognition to detect uh, a flow uh, in the capillaries uh, of eyes. Uh, and with Northwestern, uh, we're actively involved in a clinical trial uh, applying a uh, smart sensors uh, that can provide uh, clinical quality uh, data uh, for uh, different conditions, different vitals, uh, just, just like uh, Apple's uh, health devices, but clinical quality. Uh, some amazing work out of Northwestern that we're commercializing. So why, why am I saying all of that? Well, all of these are research capabilities that we'll start seeing and we start seeing in, uh, uh, in the digital products, digital first care delivery products uh, coming out. And I, uh, uh, if any one of you is tracking what's happening in industry, uh, anywhere from uh, um, Amazon opening up Amazon Care uh, and uh, um, Google uh, uh, ramping up their healthcare uh, capabilities uh, to the traditional players like Anthem and United and uh, Humana and Aetna, uh, it really is uh, a fascinating time to be in healthcare tech. Um, it's really, I, I feel like it's uh, like the, like the dot-com era for healthcare uh, in the next few years. Uh, so, uh, of course, uh, uh, consumers have been tuned to, to have some pretty high expectations. We've been using all these devices, AI devices, uh, to buy tickets and shop online and uh, have maps. Uh, so we know uh, what an engagement experience looks like. So we cannot, we cannot shortcut uh, in the healthcare space the experience. So we have to make sure that uh, whatever we deliver in terms of AI capabilities is delivered in a, fact, in a form factor in such a way that it's really very natural, uh, uh, highly usable, and anybody can use it. It does not have to be uh, uh, very uh, hard to use. So uh, what AI allows us, uh, and uh, it probably some of, the, uh, some of the discussions later today uh, will focus on that, is really to personalize care delivery. So uh, based on the data, uh, based on your personal information uh, that uh, comes from the history of the person, uh, uh, similar cohorts, uh, you can actually target the care delivery uh, to be as efficient as possible for the particular person. Um, so uh, what, we, uh, what we can achieve is uh, uh, get uh, um, deep insights uh, for how the patient uh, uh, needs to be, uh, uh, how the patient exhibits uh, uh, th their conditions and how they can be taken care of. We can tailor elegant interventions uh, we can also drive engagement and outcomes uh, through uh, AI-enabled uh, uh, interactions. Uh, and uh, also, uh, it's a learning environment. At any point of time, more and more information comes back and is available, uh, and uh, the algorithms become better. So uh, just uh, briefly, some of the capabilities that are uh, under development in my team uh, as products. Uh, kind of uh, not research, these are actually uh, products. Uh, a benefit AI assistant, uh, AI uh, symptom triage and care, care direction, that's the one I'll talk a little bit more about. A longitudinal patient record, 
um, appointment scheduling, sensors, as I mentioned, digital therapeutics. So uh, the future of healthcare is digital, and uh, there are reasons for that. Uh, first of all, the technology is available, but that's not the driver. Uh, the driver is that uh, uh, consumers believe that healthcare is unaffordable, and uh, there are ways to get higher quality, more convenient, uh, more affordable care using the latest digital technologies working hand in hand with physicians. So it's an integrated model where physicians and computers work hand in hand together to improve the quality and make more affordable access to care. Um, and uh, as an example, some stats here, 66% uh, are planning, let's uh, say planning for out of pocket health care cost is challenging. So uh, uh, people uh, frequently cannot afford the care. Um, providers uh, increasingly feel the pressure. Uh, of course, uh, quality cannot be compromised, uh, while at the same time, uh, uh, you need to uh, improve efficiency uh, and uh, improve uh, customer satisfaction. It's more and more consumers uh, expect uh, a, a consumer experience when they work with physicians. And of course, employers, uh, uh, which uh, still are a key part of uh, uh, financing the, uh, the uh, healthcare benefits, they're also under pressure to make sure that their, mem their uh, employees get the best care at the uh, most optimal uh, um, affordability. So I'll kind of uh, fly through these uh, for the interest of time, uh, but these are just some stats. Uh, uninsured rate uh, is still uh, is, uh, uh, actually edging up again from 11% in 2016 uh, back to 14%. Uh, uh, and then, uh, 50% uh, of Americans say that they can't afford to spend more than $100 on premiums. So that's a very disturbing fact. Uh, and then 50% uh, um, of Americans now use digital platforms to manage their care. So uh, people are using care already. It's just a matter of bringing that quality clinical strength to it. Okay, so... Uh, this is not a sales commercial, uh, but I wanted to give a real sense of what's out there. Uh, so uh, I've, my team has been building this over the last uh, eight, like 12 months, uh, eight to 12 months. Uh, so uh, CareSpree, it's actually available. All of you can go and download it. Uh, it's available on Apple Store and on uh, um, Google Play. Uh, so uh, this is the first release of uh, of what, we're, uh, of what will be a longer term uh, um, digital first integrated human and computer working together care delivery, care delivery platform. It is available to everybody. It's not just to Anthem members. So any one of you can go, it's direct to consumer. And uh, uh, these are just screenshots of what it does. Uh, and uh, download and play with that. Actually, I encourage you, please do. Uh, it allows you, it engages uh, the consumer, the, the user, uh, in a uh, um, session, uh, not, not unlike how a physician would engage with the consumer or with the patient, uh, and guides uh, to a, uh, uh, a uh, cohort of people that have similar symptoms uh, and, and also provides a uh, information as to how those people were diagnosed. So we're not yet an FDA uh, certified device, uh, so we're not uh, making a diagnosis. Uh, having said that, uh, as I'll speak a little bit more, I'll talk a little bit more about the details, it is based on 670 million records longitudinally over uh, 20 plus years. Uh, so uh, uh, the accuracy is uh, phenomenal. It's uh, by far the highest accuracy by a, a large margin than anything available there. So we've put a lot of investment, a lot of AI investment to, to, to make it real. So really the idea is uh, an informational system that is much better than what you can get just by going and searching on Google. Uh, so searching on Google, all of us, that's where we start when we feel uh, some pain. Uh, we go there, we search, uh, I have a headache, and uh, two minutes later, you know that you have cancer. You're going to die in a, in, a, in a few days, right? So we want to avoid that. 
Uh, we want actually to have a, uh, an intelligent system that can guide you, understand your symptoms, uh, and help you self-assess what may be the problem. So make sure that the patients, the, uh, the uh, consumer of healthcare services in the future are informed consumers, just like we're informed for many other uh, parts uh, in our daily activities. So, uh, uh, and as I mentioned, the key thing is it, it is a uh, uh, integrated human and computer system. Uh, so uh, after uh, you're done like a few minutes uh, to connect, uh, to understand what is uh, uh, the self-assessment, uh, usually the, the, the result, the outcome is uh, uh, people, um, by the way, I'm going to go slightly back. Uh, I'm going to see it here. Sorry, I don't have it. Uh, uh, okay, here it is. So uh, generally we start... Uh, with a cohort of people uh, that are like you, uh, based, as I mentioned, uh, 2.5 million uh, people, 670 million records. So uh, that's where it started, but that's growing. And we start narrowing down as the interaction continues. We start narrowing down to how many people have exhibited uh, the same symptoms as you based on uh, those uh, historical records. And at the end, you get to a much smaller cohort of people that have uh, similar capability, uh, similar uh, uh, characteristics as you that have uh, shared the same symptoms with you, and we can uh, pretty much share how those people were diagnosed, uh, what kind of uh, care plans they got, and then, the uh, importantly, at that point, you are in, uh, asked, do you want to continue to chat with a credentialed physician, uh, high-quality physicians? As you can see, uh, this is a real doctor, Dr. Uh, Ido Paz. He practices out of New York. Um, and uh, so we have a provider network. Uh, it's a fascinating, uh, I would say, a new breed of physicians, or I don't know if a new breed, but physicians that enjoy uh, practicing uh, remotely. So they, uh, they sit in front of a computer. They see what the AI interaction have, uh, uh, have uh, uh, kind of uh, understood from the, from the chat, from the virtual session. And then they have, uh, in the middle, uh, the ability to continue the chat live with the, with the user, with the patient. And on the right side of the screen, they have an AI-based uh, advisor that constantly sifts through different publications and different research, uh, giving you information what might be uh, uh, kind of what you should ask or where you should go. It's really uh, helping you, uh, helping the clinician to, um, to be very effective. So. Uh, uh, right now, it's available. Uh, I, as I mentioned, brand new. We launched uh, in August. Uh, the second release came out in September, a month later, where we added the chat with the physician. Uh, and uh, we pretty much going to have releases every other month uh, on a very aggressive uh, uh, release schedule. So uh, I will actually, for the interest of people that are interested, I'm going to talk a little bit about the underlying technology uh, because it is fascinating. Um, so there are other companies or other technologies out there like Babylon and Ada and so forth that have been out there. A majority of the technology, almost all of them that are currently available, are based on synthesizing uh, the existing uh, textbook data or medical guidelines in a rules-based system, asking questions and helping you to navigate a workflow. Um, what we developed is dramatically different. Uh, as I mentioned, uh, it is, uh, uh, well, just uh, the issue with uh, the current technology, it is uh, very good for a fairly uh, narrow, targeted uh, uh, clinical, single clinical situations, but it, uh, uh, it, it is by no means uh, uh, equivalent to an experience uh, in how a true uh, person physician would interact with uh, patients to, to understand the problem uh, and make a diagnosis. So uh, the way we've approached it, it's an entirely uh, data-driven, machine learning-based approach, uh, starting with, uh, uh, at the time, uh, that was uh, earlier uh, this year or later last year, 670 million notes of patient visits accrued since uh, 1993, uh, and uh, then uh, based on that, uh, using some really advanced uh, uh, technology, uh, it, uh, inter it provides that interaction that you can see um, 
you can download and use. Uh, so I, I spent a little bit of time uh, talking about the steps. Actually, uh, if you can see here, uh, it just got published uh, uh, literally a week ago. Uh, it is a, uh, a peer-reviewed article uh, for a clinical trial uh, using uh, the, the technology. Um, so uh, what do we do? We use proprietary NLP tools first to, uh, uh, to, extract, to uh, extract structured information uh, from the unstructured text. As you know, that, that is a hard problem. Uh, we have some pretty phenomenal capability, things like uh, handling things like negation and uh, things that are known to be very hard in uh, NLP and natural language processing. Uh, as a second step, uh, uh, we recognize patterns of how uh, symptoms uh, present differently in different adults uh, between 18 and 85 years of age. Um, so uh, really medical notes get tagged and annotated. Uh, 670 million records or notes are not easy to annotate manually, so uh, we use some advanced techniques to do uh, a semi-supervised uh, um, uh, annotation. So we annotate a small number by uh, physicians uh, and then uh, we're able to very quickly annotate the rest. Uh, and then uh, uh, proprietary machine learning classification algorithms uh, really detect uh, uh, the conditions based on patterns of uh, symptoms and personal characteristics. Uh, so uh, really the uh, idea here is uh, based on correlation between groups of symptoms uh, to, uh, and also taking into account the user demographics Part uh, the past medical information and uh, the history of present illness uh, to output a vector, uh, kind of a large uh, set of information uh, that uh, represents the distribution of conditions uh, that the cluster of people like the user uh, have received by physicians. Uh, and so uh, it's a, uh, obviously there's a lot of probabilities involved since uh, uh, medicine is hard, as you all know, uh, and uh, um, there is always some uh, uh, probability in the conclusiveness uh, of, uh, of a diagnosis, just like human physicians have the same uh, characteristics. Then in step four, uh, we uh, proceed to deconstruct the doctor notes into a set of symptom attributes and values. Uh, the, uh, we, there's a, a proprietary ontology generated. Uh, at a very fine grain, uh, ten, uh, tens of thousands of uh, um, nodes in the uh, in connections in the uh, ontology. Uh, so uh, the proprietary ontology uh, has uh, attributes such as uh, at, the, at the grain of uh, a headache for three days radiates uh, to the arm and uh, accompanied by dizziness. So it's not just your standard uh, uh, UMLS ontology or uh, so it's a kind of a quite uh, detailed in advance. And then uh, this is all great. This actually uh, is the live uh, uh, repository that continuously gets updated and uh, connections are found, new connections in, uh, maintained in a, in a very advanced graph. Uh, but you need to make that uh, interactive. So uh, on top we have a machine uh, uh, learning, uh, a machine-based conversation uh, that uh, engages uh, the uh, patient uh, into a, uh, uh, into a uh, uh, really a uh, virtual visit or consult. Uh, as I mentioned before, we cannot compromise on the usability, so uh, a lot of effort has been put into how to make that usable, how to a mixture of text and visual graphics uh, uh, guiding the patient into answering questions uh, uh, as quickly as possible and zeroing in on uh, really the goal coming into that uh, uh, patients like me or people like me cohort uh, where uh, uh, you can present uh, uh, what is the uh, present uh, um, the medical cohort's path of treatment, uh, the different conditions uh, that uh, that cohort have been diagnosed with uh, uh, and along with the full course of action of the cohort. So working with uh, encounter notes and patient records uh, uh, anonymized, by the way, of course, but uh, with all the clinical information preserved, uh, allows you to have uh, uh, some amazing, uh, some uh, some amazing uh, uh, access to label data. Basically, uh, it's uh, by physicians. 
they, uh, they do as part of their normal work. And finally, for the purpose of the study uh, that is uh, presented in this uh, paper, uh, there was a follow-up uh, where a physician continued to do a diagnosis of the patient and uh, the outcome of what the AI model uh, algorithm uh, uh, did versus what the uh, physician uh, did was compared. And this is an amazing number, 85% uh, accuracy in identifying the most likely diagnosis with the gold standard compared to the gold standard of a physician uh, doing that. So. Uh, uh, by far, uh, this is by far uh, the closest you can get to a uh, uh, usable, uh, clinically valid uh, uh, system. Although, again, I want to make sure it's this is not a uh, FDA uh, certified. It's not a diagnosis system. It's an informational system. So, uh, for the interest of time, I think I have a couple more minutes. I just want to uh, kind of finish with our vision. Uh, where we're going from here. Uh, so uh, I believe that the key to accessing healthcare usually is in our hands, in, in our pocket. Uh, I don't know about you, but I spend uh, upward of 12, 14 hours a day with my phone, definitely more than I spend with my wife. Uh, and uh, my phone knows a lot more about me than anybody else. It knows where I go uh, as, I, uh, as I interact uh, uh, and that's it's my trusted advisor. When, when I need to ask questions about uh, how do I get from here to the airport, it will uh, guide me the best, the most optimal way. When I need to shop for something, it will give me an advice. Well, we believe uh, it will be also our trusted advisor to help us interact with the healthcare system, understand what's, uh, uh, what is potentially my condition, and also help me navigate the system, find uh, where uh, where the 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 best place uh, for me to uh, get care is. So uh, starting with the uh, trusted uh, AI powered virtual assistant that's already launched, uh, it's in the market. Uh, following up uh, with uh, uh, a uh, getting a convenient access to care through chat. Uh, uh, video is coming shortly, uh, but also different modalities, uh, different approaches like uh, at home care, clinic, uh, ER, all through the convenience of uh, uh, being able to schedule uh, at your best convenience uh, uh, where at the location where uh, is the most appropriate uh, both clinically and based on your personal preferences. Uh, then uh, uh, we would like uh, to move more and more into making services transparently available so people can shop. Again, I just want to point that right now this is uh, direct to consumer. It does not assume anthem members. Uh, currently, chatting with a physician uh, costs $19, which is significantly less than a typical copay. Uh, and, uh, it, uh, and it is $19 for a session uh, that uh, uh, up to two weeks, uh, really a session is getting a conclusive uh, diagnosis and care plan by the credentialed physician. So. Uh, uh, and uh, that's uh, available and making, make, making it available. It's a marketplace where people can shop and find the appropriate care for them. Uh, and then uh, coming a little later, also the ability to transact uh, in a more consumer-friendly way with vouchers, QR codes, and so forth. So a lot of that is uh, coming next. So I'd like to thank all of you. Uh, and. Uh, it wasn't supposed to be a, a commercial of what we do, but it's, uh, it's supposed to be a case study of where digital care is going, uh, a real example. So very excited to answer any questions. Where did you source the patient records, and in particular, the physician notes that have built your people like me portion of your platform? Yep. So uh, our uh, initial, we, we're launching a partnership with a company from Israel. Uh, so we got access to uh, uh, 2.5 million records uh, in one of the HMOs there. Uh, phenomenal uh, uh, longitudinal quality. Uh, and uh, as we continue with the, the appropriate consent and privacy, uh, as we are uh, in the U.S. now, we're adding more and more. We also ran some pilots in several states in the U.S. And uh, uh, that information, that data also starts to get part of the modeling. Uh, doctor, uh, actually three questions. Uh, mm -hmm. First question I know is uh, 
uh, CareSpray only uh, launched in uh, August, two months ago. Mm -hmm. But the first question is how many uh, uh, users, especially active users, uh, are there now? So this is one question. Second question, when you, when you guys work on this project, uh, what, was, what was the most difficult part for, for you guys? Is it like the technology or the healthcare? Because I noticed you, you guys use uh, uh, proprietary uh, algorithms, not like the well-known algorithms. So uh, technology was the, the hardest part or uh, other yeah. things. Uh, third question. Uh, uh, so you mentioned uh, you know the payment and uh, is that payment covered by insurance or not? So three questions. Sure. Thank you so much. Yeah. So uh, um, so uh, first question was oh how many users? So uh, uh, we're kind of uh, it's production quality, but it's uh, in a uh, soft <coughs> launch, so uh, we have not we're not actively marketing it until January first. So uh, it's mostly word of mouth testing, getting. Uh, uh, so I think we have, uh, I can look, stats change every day. Uh, it's uh, several thousand. Uh, and uh, we're getting some uh, phenomenal uh, uh, user results on, on both stores. Uh, so our goal is really to open it up to, to a broad audience. So everybody should have access to that. So we're getting ready for that. Uh, challenges, uh, I mean, it's an exciting project. So anybody who is in... Uh, Medicine and in AI probably feels the same way that this is a very exciting thing. So uh, a lot of challenges. So uh, uh, from a, in a good way, challenges, right? So uh, the natural language processing uh, is a, uh, I mean, a lot of work went in there. Uh, coming up with the ontology and uh, causality, uh, uh, and how do you actually have uh, physicians help? So really. Uh, the, the operating model uh, with uh, uh, some of both within what my team <coughs> and some of our partners, it's really we have a uh, one physician for every data scientist pretty much, so kind of working hand in hand. Uh, so uh, both the data science side and the uh, clinical side. Um, so uh, in addition, so th those are the exciting challenges. Uh, I mean, there are other challenges like uh, Typical, uh, it's, a, it's a commercial, it's a production system, so it has to be security. We're, we're going through a very, we're extremely sensitive to protecting it, so it's high, highly, uh, high grade of security, uh, scalability, it has to be up and running, so there's just software engineering and infrastructure things that we're handling for that scale. Uh, and uh, there's a third, how, how is it paid for? So, so right now it's uh, out of pocket. Uh, we, str we believe that uh, for a lot of conditions, especially in primary care, more and more people will opt for a affordable pay-out-of-pocket scenario. We see a lot of that. Uh, and uh, uh, it will be, as in January, it will become available to uh, members, so it will become part of uh, uh, benefits uh, and, uh, for certain test accounts. Uh, and uh, we believe that... Uh, the sweet spot would be also both people that are uh, underinsured as well as people that are in high deductible health plans uh, that are very sensitive to price and they really want to have the best quality and affordable price. So. Um, so I have two technical questions. Uh, my first question is that we all know that the topics that are related to healthcare are really sensitive and our evaluation metrics are really important and you said that your your evaluation metric was accuracy and you got like like 85 percent it, it was not I mean we have all the metrics that you, you would expect in a classification problem yeah, but it's, it's like actually amazing but my question was that did you check any other evaluation metrics like precision recall oh yeah, all because that. sometimes like we have like false negatives and if your model just predicts like wrongly so it is really bad because these yes. things are very sensitive so did you check other metrics yes too? Okay. yeah absolutely Yes. So, so I, ju I just reported, uh, you can read also the paper, it's, uh, there are a lot more numbers there. Okay. I just didn't want to... And yeah. uh, so it was as good as the accuracy, yes. right? Yes. Yeah. Okay, so oh, yeah. that's, that's really good. Yeah. And my second question is that, what kind of models did you use for training? Like? So uh, all, all different models, uh, we tested with many. Uh, so anywhere from simple, like, uh, uh, so, so 
a lot of Bayesian models, as okay, you can like experience. Classic, classical yeah, machine learning Yeah, uh, plus uh, also uh, neural nets and deep learning as okay. well. So, uh, neural, so net, neural networks were the best, right? Yeah, they go to the bathroom, right? Depends. Because uh, depends on the is, amount of data you have. Uh, on, depends on many things. Because your data set was really big. That was really amazing because most of the time mm -hmm. you don't have big data sets in mm -hmm. medical sciences. Yeah, but when, when you start getting so... Uh, we're currently working, so uh, I, I can tell you that uh, uh, things using <coughs> the latest uh, NLP techniques like BERT is still... We, we haven't launched that yet, so... Uh, uh, so, uh, but uh, uh, even if the data is so large, when you start getting into a cohort of people with your symptoms, the data shrinks quickly. So uh, frequently you end up different models performing differently. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I think there's someone in the back too. Someone in the back. Thank you for the talk. Just two uh -huh. maybe quick questions. One, how do you get around licensure issues in states? Do you have li physicians licensed in various states and you connect that way? And second, you sh you do use video or, or photos to exchange information? Sure. Uh, our physicians, uh, our network, it's growing. Uh, credentialed, I think, in 42 states now. By the end of the year, we'll be licensed to operate in all states. Uh, and uh, I'll be lo we'll be launching... Uh, either by the end of the year or early Q1, uh, the video uh, interaction. Uh, it's uh, some interesting studies uh, uh, in terms of uh, segments and uh, se segments both based on people and based on conditions of preferences to chat versus video. So uh, <coughs> video does, uh, does not mean it's better. There are certain situations where it is. In a lot of situations, people actually prefer it can get better by texting and chatting. To what extent do you think uh, the system can engage in the uh, behavioral health determinants of health problems? Yeah. This is a very, uh, a very near and dear to our hearts. Uh, uh, we, will, uh, we are going after conditions one at a time. Uh, right, a, a lot of conditions, uh, currently 220, uh, support mostly primary care type. Uh, by the end of the year, we'll be launching in uh, uh, behavioral health, and uh, uh, we believe that, uh, in particular, uh, managing symptoms uh, would be a, an initial very um, useful capability, right? People that have chronic uh, uh, mental conditions. Uh, and then, uh, uh, I mean, we have physicians that are actively working in that space and bringing uh, our goal is anything that can be made better, a more convenient, uh, higher quality using digital technology is within scope. So uh, uh, there's so much research going in different universities, and we go through a validating, testing, clinical research whenever it's ready. So uh, Parkinson's is uh, ripe for uh, um, getting some capability, especially with sensors. We have kind of combining sensor data with historical. All right. Uh, then yeah. after that, so here, here, and then here. Okay. Uh, my question is actually more related to the workflow. So, what's the recommended workflow here? Is the is your member supposed to use the, the actual platform and then take the findings to their primary care physician? Uh, is the primary care physician looped in on the findings automatically? I'm just kind of curious as to the actual sequence of events. Sure. Uh, and I don't know the answer yet. So we're also exploring the options. Uh, so the current the current flow is uh, uh, really replacing uh, up from your Google search. Right? So something's happening. I need to know. I'm, it's two o'clock in the morning on a Saturday. It's not ten o'clock on a Tuesday, right? So I don't know what's going on. Uh, so uh, we believe that the first interaction would be try to get some peace of mind, some understanding of what's going on. Uh, then the next step is we call it escalation of care to a um, to the different modalities. So initially, you'd go to chat, continue chatting with the physician. Uh, potentially, your symptom, uh, uh, your uh, condition can be uh, diagnosed and care plan down there, maybe if it's an easy one, right? So prescribe a medication. Uh, if not, it moves up uh, to uh, uh, video or to in-person visit uh, schedule, go in the morning, uh, and if needed, ER visit, things like that. Uh, 
we are uh, the information uh, it's like uh, I mean these are real credential positions so uh, with the appropriate uh, so uh, uh, <coughs> the same HIPAA data privacy rules apply right so uh, uh, your data is available for providing care so it goes into your longitudinal record uh, and uh, uh, that becomes available to your primary care physician right? if, uh, just like a normal uh, uh, workflow uh, the transfer between uh, the virtual and uh, chat and primary is something that we're still exploring so what would be the best model and uh, not everybody uses their primary. Uh, will the primary become a virtual eventually uh, or a online primary? So there are different models. So we'll be learning as we go and testing different models. I think two more questions. I, I really liked how you were able to take uh, real data and then run people's symptoms and questions through it to get something that, that makes sense. Uh, one of the questions I had was, how, how do you uh, plan on engaging the practitioners that are credentialed to be up 24 hours when these all come in, all these, these questions. Um, do they get reimbursed? Is there insurance mm -hmm. codes? And yeah. how is that user interface to keep them engaged after they've done it once or twice? And the other question I had was, is this something that Anthem uh, created organically, or did you collaborate outside, say, with the company in Israel or some of the other mm -hmm. uh, facilities to grow your team? Because is it a big team that does this, or yeah. you know, those, those are the sure. questions I had. Yeah. So uh, um, the, the first one was uh, engaging. Okay. So yeah, this is this is a great question. Oh yeah, oh yeah. The success we would be successful uh, if physicians, uh, clinicians endorse that. Uh, it's no question about that. Uh, and uh, there's a lot of activity going on in that space right now. Uh, the initial, as I, as I mentioned, is a network of people that are willing and that's their interest. They, they're passionate about providing care online. Uh, and uh, they are just, they have a practice, so a typical medical practice, and we contract with them. It's, uh, uh, and they are available, there are certain hours, and uh, we, we make uh, optimization so we have coverage. Right, so uh, uh, the interesting question becomes uh, uh, is uh, after the initial phase when we are starting to engage the actual like the Northwesterns, the Cleveland clinics, and so forth, and the, uh, just this uh, also the uh, indiv 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 individual independent provider uh, um, offices. So uh, uh, there are diff so so all all reimbursable. Uh, Still, there are several things that uh, are uh, being explored. So I can uh, speak to that, right, uh, uh, anywhere from a combination of uh, uh, giving them an opportunity to set their prices. As I mentioned, there's a marketplace uh, uh, idea there uh, to just uh, also regular contract contracts and so forth. Our goal is to become more and more transparent. We believe that care, uh, so re really the uh, the platform connects providers and patients, and we're exploring what's the best way to do it that works for everybody. In terms of development, uh, uh, I actually joined Anthem in October of last year, uh, hired to do this, uh, and uh, we bootstrapped rapidly with some partners, but also grew a team. Uh, we have about, uh, uh, about 100, develop 100 technical people in-house uh, that are highly qualified, uh, plus uh, several uh, external uh, kind of partnerships. So we, yeah, we, we don't intend to build everything ourselves, but we have the core, a lot of the core uh, ideas uh, are and will become more and more powerful. Last question, Carl. Last question? All right, Carl Kogendorfer. Palman, great job, thank you. Thank you. Um, and uh, I actually had the, uh, a pleasure of, of meeting Varda Shalev, a uh, family physician and informaticist that I know you guys are working with uh, 
uh, with K-Health out of the Israel, the company. And, okay, uh, yeah. Um, so they're a very small group, small lab, and you've got Anthem, very big company. How, what are the barriers and uh, keys to success? We're in a hub of, of startups and, and, yes. and uh, companies. So how, what can we learn from that partnership and, and what can these folks learn from uh, uh, you know, Anthem working with, with smaller groups? And Absolutely. Uh, this is an amazing question. So uh, a little bit about my background. So I'm a techie. I'm, uh, uh, and uh, I think TJ was talking. I'm also a graduate of UIC. I got my PhD there uh, under Pete Nelson. <laughs> uh, and... Uh, for whatever reason, uh, most of my career has been entrepreneurship. Not in, so all, if you look at everything I've done was say startup inside a large company. I mean, it just self-select or for, for whatever reason. Uh, at companies like Sun Microsystems and Motorola and so forth. So uh, uh, I think that uh, being successful with uh, startups is, uh, there's certain skills in mastery that you learn. Uh, initially, some of the, so after evaluation and selecting companies, uh, some of them said, oh, we, we can't really work with you. You're too big. You're too slow. And now they're actually saying, wow, you guys are amazing. You're uh, just uh, like us. So uh, uh, we're actually structured. My team <coughs> is structured as a, almost like, as, as a separate entity. Uh, you'll see it, we are uh, actually Care Market Inc. Uh, and uh, uh, we still uh, follow uh, a lot of the Anthem policies as far as... Uh, data privacy and so forth, but in terms of moving fast and uh, development, agile development processes and interactions, we're just running like a startup. That's the only way you can achieve that. So. All right, thank Wonderful. you. For that. Thank you, Plumman. All right. So as we uh, just switch out the laptops uh, for the next speaker, there are seats up here at the front. There's at least five or six seats here, so folks in the back. This is the right time to get a front row seat. So with that, uh, we'll kick off with uh, Dr. Jeffrey Loeb from University of Illinois. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you. It's going to be a far hard, hard act to follow. Um, uh, it's also a really fascinating as a practicing physician, uh, one who actually reads a lot of those 607 million notes from other doctors. Um, sometimes it's a challenge. To, uh, there's a lot of noise uh, in these notes uh, from that type of data. Um, so um, I will tell a little bit about myself. Um, I had a sort of a circular course as well. Um, I started in Chicago in my education a little bit further south at U of C, not UIC. Uh, after 11 years, they kicked me out. I went to Boston. I was at Harvard for a while, Detroit, and then very happy to come back to UIC now for the past years as the uh, head of the Department of Neurology and Rehabilitation Medicine. Um, during this time, I also got very interested in building something I'll tell you about, our University of Illinois Neuro Repository um, and the Biomedical Informatics Core uh, through our NIH-sponsored uh, CCTS grant. So I don't think I need to tell folks in this group the, uh, the rising importance of neurological disorders uh, as well as the uh, many failures, although there may be some success lately in Alzheimer's disease, uh, stroke, epilepsy, Parkinson's. Uh, clearly, studies have shown there's going to be an excess need for uh, neurologists. Uh, maybe now we don't need those neurologists because we'll have our handheld things. Uh, but the brain is fairly complicated, and uh, a lot of different modalities just besides those notes uh, come into play when you're evaluating a patient. Uh, psychiatry, uh, equally challenging, if not more, and uh, a clear need for additional psychiatrists, psychologists uh, is huge. And, and just as we walk down the streets of Chicago, we realize this. So here's a slide of um, uh, how AI can be harnessed to understand neurological and psychiatric disorders and choose the right treatments uh, from a recently published paper in Biological Psychiatry. Um, the challenge is, in many cases, the differential diagnosis uh, has a name, has a diagnosis, has a, has a, a code on it. Um, a lot of times they're not right or they're, they're, they're very heterogeneous populations in these, as you can see from here. 
um, additional variables, intra and intra disease variables such as genetics, life experience, behavior, um, things we can measure on brain imaging come into play. And then that may help us stratify biologically those patients into different subgroups. Uh, once we have those end of phenotypes, then the AI can come in and develop predictive models so that we can actually do a better job of diagnosing patients. Um, I just remember when I was a resident, um, as a neurology resident, I would read all the charts and I did psychiatry as part of my rotation. Um, charts back then, paper were this high uh, many, many years. And as I would go through years and years of diagnosis in those patients, I would see many, many diagnoses fluctuating based on how the symptoms fluctuated from one moment to the next. So it's, it's really a big challenge. So, so we, we need this AI black box, but what I'm going to emphasize today is what's most important is what comes in. What is the data that we use to train our algorithms that we use to feed into this? And that's going to determine whether we get this happy result with a properly diagnosed and treated patient uh, or not so happy result uh, that we also have in our clinical practice as well, even without AI. So is, is this really possible? And I want to talk about today some of the obstacles. Um, as I mentioned, it can be challenging to diagnose patients with neuropsychiatric disorders, even without AI. Uh, so simply saying using our current state of knowledge or notes to make a better diagnosis, it's, it's, it's what we put into it. Maybe AI can do better. Second, the data is really messy, uh, often inconsistent. As I talked about the charts, uh, changing from one year to the next in the patients, a different diagnosis, uh, not uncommon. And, and some of the disorders we don't really understand that well. What do we do with those patients, uh, say, that don't fit the model, that don't fit in? Do we plug them into a formula? Are we doing harm? Uh, that's really important. So again, the major take home of what I want to talk about is how can we do a better job of putting better data into the algorithms that we use so what goes in is what comes out is useful. Uh, another challenge is, you know, we talked about electronic health records as one source of data. But that's only one source of data. We have imaging studies. We have lab tests. We have many other things. Uh, that are commonly put together in order to make a diagnosis. And a lot of these data, are very, data sets are very siloed in different computer systems that don't talk to each other. So NIH, uh, in its strategic plan for data science, uh, uh, last year came out with a, a definition of data science as interdisciplinary field of inquiry in which quantitative and analytical approaches, processes, and systems are developed and used to extract knowledge and insights from increasingly large and or complex sets of data. And some of the pressing issues identified, again, is the data is often siloed, not optimally integrated or interconnected. And many different formats are not easily shared, findable, or interoperable. If you have a machine that produces data in one format and somebody has a machine that produces data in another format, somebody has to make a connection between those two different types of data formats. So I want to talk to you a little bit now, way, way in the, in the sort of before we even get to the front end, let alone the back end, uh, of this process, uh, kind of a solution that we've kind of uh, been approaching at our University of Illinois Neuro Repository. Um, and our approach is to start with highly focused projects, disease specific, one disease at a time, and really start out not with just with raw data, but really assembling subject experts who are going to tell us what are the key data, meta, metadata elements that are going to help drive that decision making process of what's going on, um, develop novel ways to store and integrate silo data. Uh, there are no platforms that hold all these different types of data together. Then we can apply our artificial intelligence. Another thing that's really important in anything we do scientifically uh, is have a way to validate a gold standard to say we got it right so that we can actually get an assessment of how good our algorithms are. So I'm going to tell three stories today of how we've been really not doing AI yet per se, but collecting data so that someone can do the AI in a way that's highly curated, highly integrated, and highly informative, both for existing diagnosis and discovery. We're very interested in discovery because the treatments we have right now for these diseases are really not effective. So I'm going to talk about what's near and dear to what I do clinically, which is epilepsy. And seizures are clinical manifestations of hypersynchronous activity of neurons in the brain. Um, they fire in a highly synchronous way in ways they should not. The way we measure epileptic activity is by putting electrodes on the scalp, or sometimes, as I'll show, directly on the brain surface to record these potentials that are abnormal. And it's a big disease in 1% of the world's population. Often patients will have a focal onset that could be an unusual symptom, a bad smell, a taste, or a weird feeling. It spreads and then leads to a convulsion. 
So when patients fail to respond to medical treatments, we can perform a surgical procedure to remove that focus, to remove that initiating zone in the brain. And by removing that zone, that's the only way we can often cure this disease now. So this is an example of a patient who has hundreds of electrodes on portions of their brain. Each of those little discs you see here are on a recording electrode. Um, we can identify the seizure onset by which of the electrodes have that potential, that seizure discharge underneath them, and then localize that in three-dimensional space and design a second surgery to remove that tissue. And so here's showing a rhythmic discharge coming from that part of the brain. Um, there's a ton of data that we generate. I mean, we sample at about 1,000 uh, samples per second in 100 different locations. We'll record these patients for days on end, maybe a week, and we get a lot of white noise that we often don't know what to do with. And people have been doing AI on this EEG or electroencephalography data for years uh, to develop predictive models, and it just has not worked. There's too much noise. It's TMI. So what we do is we first say, what's the metadata? Can we extract something that we can reliably detect from here uh, and then use that to focus on rather than just the raw, noisy data? And so this is an algorithm we developed to just mark what we call the spikes, the little sharp waves. We then quantify in each of these brain locations, which record, correspond to each of these lines, onto the three-dimensional brain surface so we can see exactly which parts of that person's brain are firing at high rates versus low rates and help guide our surgical procedures. Um, this is a study uh, recently published uh, where we've shown that the synchrony of the spikes actually aren't that synchronous and adds another level without going through the details uh, we see spikes that look like they're synchronous. We apply a directed direct transfer function. We do a connectivity analysis, and we turn what seems like white noise into a, a nice orderly conduction pathway of how seizures propagate in the brain. Um, how we test and validate this is we do it on day one, day two, day three. Uh, so from this one patient here, we see the pattern is very similar at three different times we measure it. A lot of the data that we get from MRIs and other types of data, uh, if you do the same study on the same patient the next day, you get a different result. So something about the, the quality and reproducibility of data needs to somehow go into if we're going to have data sets that are going to be useful to make new discoveries. And here's just an example of another patient. Each patient has their own network. And we never knew what these networks looked like before. We simplified, chose that metadata, and then develop an algorithm to follow how the spikes propagate on the brain. So, so not to, not to, to sort of uh, bore or gross you out with pictures and medical things, um, we have an amazing opportunity just with this one disease where we undergo epilepsy surgery on patients. Um, we have this amazingly uh, three-dimensionally mapped human brains. We have tissue that we remove from these surgeries that we can localize, localize precisely to the same locations where we recorded uh, on the brain. And can we take advantage of this to make new discoveries about how the brain works and this particular disease? So this is what the neurorepository is all about. It's a data repository with all the clinical information, all of the hit tissue that comes from it, and then the data that comes from that tissue that's all precisely localized in three-dimensional space. So for example, if this were a block of tissue that was removed as part of the patient's surgery, we would subdivide that piece of tissue take half of it, look at the structure or the histology of the tissue, the other half of it, we break it up into strips and look at every protein, every gene, every molecule in that tissue. So it's, it's kind of a big data set, but it's on a very, very focused uh, area. So these are the, the number of different parameters that we measure uh, at the organ level, uh, where in the brain the tissue comes from, what the histology looked like, uh, the genetics, the genomics, proteomics, metabolomics, and all of this is a lot of data, and it's normally very siloed data that's stored differently and used differently. So the major challenge here is how do we integrate these types of data? How do we build a data structure where we can actually uh, derive useful insights from this very complex data? Not on, not on 600 million patients, but just on a few. We could potentially gain a lot of insight. So we built this project uh, called Systems Biology of Epilepsy Project where we have the integration of our clinical information, like we talked about the health record, uh, quantitative brain recordings, the EEG, uh, imaging in three-dimensional space. We have to keep track of what tissue we have and where it's stored in which box and which freezer. And anything that we generate from that tissue that also localizes to that precise brain location, all the genes, proteins, and molecules. And the goal is when you put this together to identify biomarkers of the disease, develop diagnostics, and therapeutics. So I just want to run through some screenshots. So now, now to the front end uh, for this project. 
So here's a patient we can search, uh, de-identified patient number 150. He's a 33-year-old African-American male who had subcortical heterotopias. Uh, he took the following medications. Uh, he had the following imaging findings, uh, had the outcome from surgery, and had this many seizures. We do a complete battery of neuropsychological testing. Anything from his IQ to memory functions, naming functions, all of that goes in. And there's, for a research purpose, there's input and outflow. So you click on the little Excel button, and it dumps it to your spreadsheet. But if you're a clinician, it, it, it's a nice way to store the data and dump it back to take care of that patient as well. Um, electrodes, so we keep track of every electrodes. This patient had uh, 10 electrodes on this page, nine pages, 90 electrodes on his brain. Um, and this is the quantitative spike frequency and all the other electrical parameters that we measure at those precise brain locations. Again, you can dump it to your spreadsheet. We develop a 3D model of that person's individualized brains. All of our brains have different shapes. Uh, we can't just take a, a normalized brain. Uh, we can uh, put an arrow on a certain spot. It tells us which electrode it is, links it back to the electrical data and the 3D brain structure. So now we can go back to all the imaging modalities that were done and say, now we've got tissue, now we've got genes. Let's go back and look and see what the MRI showed. Maybe we'll learn better biomarkers and better ways to do imaging. Um, we keep a, a tissue repository uh, where we keep track of what we do and what we use the tissue for, whether it's frozen or fixed. And we keep our 2D images, uh, which includes uh, pictures of the, of the electrodes and every histological section so you can look at the structure of the cells and the tissue. So if you, you click on your, your thumbnail, you get the high resolution image. Uh, we do RNA pre preparations, protein preparations, and in this particular case, uh, we looked at 43,000 genes in that one brain location and say whether they go up or down relative to an area that wasn't spiking. Um, so this is, this is our version of, of big data. Um, it's, it's unique in the sense that it's an integrated, multivariate type of data set as opposed to a focused monolithic data. Um, it involves bringing lots of different types of data together. So the next challenge is, well, how do we do this? How do we find that needle in the haystack? And we've used a number of approaches. And, and to be honest, a lot of the discoveries we've made have not been that hard to find once we brought the data together that's well curated. Uh, it hasn't required uh, much more than a day or two on a, on a computer. Even a PC, we can actually find things uh, with this type of data. So just to show an example of how we can link different types of data together, uh, this is our multivariate interactome. Um, we take a certain measure, such as a neuron in the brain. We call that neuron type 4. We have a nuclear protein. We show in different patients in different samples that they have a parallel pattern of expression. So these things correlate positively, as opposed to this neuron has a negative or an inverse correlation to a particular uh, what's called a long non-coding RNA. When you do all the relationships and you create a visualization of this, uh, you can actually see this multivariate interactome where we have everything from RNA species to metabolites to different protein fractions, cell types, medications, age, seizure type, clinical variables into a correlation matrix uh, where we can see clusters of different types of objects coming together. Uh, here is a cluster of a blood cell where different proteins shown as the triangles uh, cluster from the proteomics. Uh, different metabolites come together. A medication pops into this just out of the blue, leucosamide. We don't know why. There are reports of anemia using this drug. So maybe there's some insights. So the way this software works is you can click on every object and look at the relationship to every other object. Here's another example of age-dependent variables. We have brain tissue and data from patients of six months of age all the way to plus 50 years of age. Um, and so any age-dependent genes, proteins, molecules that may be different at different ages, which could be important for understanding therapeutics and diagnostics. This medication by Gabertrin pops into this cluster and links to various variables because it's a drug that's only given to babies. So that's sort of reassuring that something that's age-specific like a drug pops into this cluster. So, so we call this our discovery machine. Um, it's going to help us understand both epilepsy and the human brain. Um, it's given us new drugs and biomarkers for epilepsy. Uh, so small molecule development programs are underway for a couple of leads that we have right now. We have NIH funding for that. Uh, we have a number of growing intellectual property and patents uh, through the university of uh, non-coding RNAs and metabolomic brain imaging method, which was fortunately recently funded by the CBC here to move forward, and, and so forth. So this was initially called the Systems Biology of Epilepsy Project, and um, we sort of had to think of a, a name for the platform. And when thinking of a name, I, I, I thought about what I do when I see a patient. Um, we talked about it. I read the chart. I look at the old medical records. If I get them, a lot of times you don't get them. 
Um, you see what medications they take. You look at their brain imaging. I look at everything. I don't believe what's in those reports because most of the time, as an expert, they're wrong to me. They don't do what I need them to do for that patient. Um, I looked at the brain waves. Um, I put it all together. It rattles around in my head. And if, if I'm lucky, a little light bulb pops up. And I say, aha. And that's kind of what intuition does. And the only way that that works, it can't be just one type of data. It's got to be integrated sets of multimodal data that we can put into our brain. This is, I guess, is it artificial intelligence or real intelligence? I don't know. But, but so we decided to call it intuition. So our current database on our current server is we call intuition 1.0. It has disadvantages. We're manually taking silo data and feeding it in. Uh, we're curating it. Um, no AI technology is used. It's very user focused and static. Intuition 2.0 is our next generation that we're working on right now for automatic data integration pathways, AI and ML uh, technology supported data, curation system focused, APIs, um, and really optimizing the end user experience. And some, some end users may be researchers trying to discover new genes. Uh, somebody may be, may be a clinician trying to make a diagnosis on a patient. The same data can be used uh, for both. So the way we're proceeding with this is creating, creating these um, um, uh, subgroups of experts to generate what are the best metadata for epilepsy. And then when we do brain tumors, what is the best for brain tumors? Diabetes. We need to bring those people together to assemble those. So what do we need to get out of the medical record for an epilepsy patient? Imaging. We need to know exactly where every piece of tissue comes from on their three-dimensional brains. If they had electrical recordings, um, actually our next speaker, Robbie and I, we have a, an ongoing group as part of this to talk about how can we do better on doing our signal processing and collect better uh, metadata sets. All the genomics that comes out, et cetera, and the tissue histology. So can we bring this all together? Um, next project, post-traumatic epilepsy. So um, often when you hit your head, you bleed around your brain. That's called a subarachnoid hemorrhage. Sometimes it happens from an innate abnormality, such as an aneurysm shown here. Uh, we have a very large throughput of patients with subarachnoid hemorrhages at our intensive care unit. Um, a lot of data is generated in these patients uh, from many, many modalities. And this is just a picture I downloaded from the web showing lots of things that go beep and buzz and whatever in the ICU. And there's just constant data just sort of feeding into this. Um, but whatever happens in those one or two weeks in the ICUs can be extremely important to your outcome. Are you going to think? Are you going to speak? Are you going to have seizures? So some of the data is the brain waves, which again requires some metadata analysis, uh, imaging, which is going to require some, some metrics that we come up with. Um, and can we put all this together in some way so that we can identify what we do in those first two weeks translates to a good outcome versus a bad outcome for that patient? So we have a project funded by the Department of Defense uh, and CURE, which is a local epilepsy organization, to identify whether it's radiological, electrical, uh, laboratory, clinical findings of subarachnoid hemorrhage to predict who develops epilepsy and who does not. Uh, the goal is, as we heard about, creating longitudinal dashboards. Uh, dashboard can be useful not only uh, retrospectively for research, but if we were generating these continuously, it could actually help in the care of patients. So what does the CT show, the, the MRI show, what does the EG show, what medication started and stopped at which time points? Those time lock differences are very, very important if we're going to ever figure out what we're doing is working and what it might be due to or not due to. So we're collecting and building that data set, including a lot of EEG work, uh, as we talked about. Uh, last disorder, uh, it's a rare and orphan disease disorder called Sturge Weber syndrome. Um, these have become very popular because of the homogeneity of patient populations. Um, it's a rare disorder, so we have to work with multiple centers across the country. We work with a foundation called the Sturge Weber Foundation, um, and we have an NIH uh, U54 grant to develop a similar longitudinal marker study uh, to understand how the disease progresses. Um, this is a disease that's caused by a gene mutation. Uh, many of you have seen folks with the, the large red angioma on the face. Uh, actually, there's an A&E TV show coming out that they filmed at our place with one of my patients, so stay tuned. Um, abnormal brain development leads to cognitive dysfunction, seizures, headaches, and these very strange stroke-like episodes that we don't understand. And then the disease progresses through life, and the patients have a huge amount of emotional distress, not knowing what's going to happen next to them, and we have no predictive models. And we don't know what the good treatments are, so it's so rare, and there's so few patients that have this. Um, should we give seizure medication, migraine, calcium channel blockers, blood thinners? So data integration is key to this, especially when you have uh, scattered patients the, around the country. We need a way to collect this in a uniform way. We have 27 centers of excellence, a central database, 
formatting, identifying those key metadata elements that we want to study, and then downstream. Once we've built this, I don't think the machine learning will be that hard. But the challenge is getting the data together. That's not what we do as a routine as physicians these days, as you probably know from reading medical records. They're a mess. And he says, this would be very useful. If I were seeing this patient in the clinic, I would love to see this dashboard of this patient. OK, here's the age of this person. Um, this is when they had seizures. This is when they had headaches at this different ages. This is when they took medicine one, medicine two, medicine three. Um, and these are the different imaging findings, uh, raw images or metadata, like quantitation of calcifications and things that we can do. And we can kind of build on these dashboards as we, as we learn new metadata that's important. We can keep adding to these dashboards. So um, how? Can AI be harnessed to understand neurological and psychiatric disorders and choose the right treatments? Uh, what I just want to emphasize today is what goes in. And uh, very few people, I've, I've given these talks to many folks, and everybody drools over the data, but nobody wants to spend the time to make these data sets. So we're putting together a team to really generate amazing data sets. So where we go from maybe not so great an outcome to a better outcome. Um, Intuition 2.0 is going to be important, I think, for the workforce uh, in the state of Illinois. We have students, we have faculty, we have industry partnerships, and we're looking for more. Intellectual property keeps coming out of this, and, and we have therapeutic targets, diagnostic markers, uh, software copyrights. And then you have to think it's a new idea. What's the business model? And I actually have some folks here that are kind of helping me uh, think about that. You know, how do we do these partnerships? How do we do licensing fees, grant funding? Um, the, the Center for Clinical Translational Science, which is our NIH-funded clinical care uh, research center at the university is very much involved with this. So it has the potential to expand not just one disease, but our entire healthcare system. And again, the potential private partnerships that we've been discussing with pharmaceutical companies, IT companies, electronic medical companies, and insurance companies. We've had wonderful discussions to start out with the Discovery Partners Institute. Maybe this could be a good model. We're still talking about this. And then let's see, what, what is our niche? What is our unique niche compared to other models where people have been looking at building data sets like this? And many of you have seen those involved in population health, in cancers such as Flatiron and Tempest. Um, not much is going on in the brain right now like this. So I think we have a unique niche uh, to find disease-specific personalized medicine. So that's what I had to say today. And uh, I'll entertain any questions. Thank you. We have time for just one or two quick questions. I'll be quick. Uh, are you doing any work uh, with regards to concussion? Um, are we doing work with regards to concussion? Um, that's a real messy one in terms of data. Um, there's not a lot of good data about this. There's not a good uh, metrics at this point. Um, so the answer is no. I, I, wish we, I wish we could do more. My, my daughter had a concussion. It's awful. But our level of understanding, our ability to generate data sets that we can mine is not strong. Uh, thanks for a great talk. It was uh, great information. Uh, I'm facing the fa same problem in my startup in uh, considering the amount of data, structure of the data. Uh, the software that we are developing is diagnostic for brain aneurysm. As you mentioned, this data are not easy to find. So you as an institute or hospital system, you have access to this uh, data and you can go back to the PAC system and download as much as you want. What do you suggest uh, startups like us do for that kind of uh, lack of data set? Well, I think that's the business model. I think we should partner. Obviously, we have to do it in an ethical way uh, based on you know, our patients and their consents uh, for the type of information, uh, de-identifying things. But uh, I don't think we do enough as an academic institution to share our data in useful ways with startups, with industry. Um, I, I think it could be valuable. So we should talk. Wonderful. Thank you, Dr. Lowe. Let's introduce Dr. Uh, Ravi Iyer from UIUC. Thank you. Well, you know, when you come, when you have these kinds of meetings, you, you're never sure how many people will show up. So this morning, as we were driving up, I said to Kathy that uh, perhaps there will be at least 10, because there are, we know a few people who are coming, and there's Carl and myself and others. And so I'm really impressed at the audience, and of course, impressed at uh, 
Carl's ability to pull this together. I think he's the brainchild. Thank you. <coughs> well, I'm uh, also thankful to, to Jeff. I think he disappeared. Ah, there you are. For giving such a um, w you know broad talk that it lets me go and effectively um, you know lead off the way you left and say here's how you could analyze the data that you have. Um, so uh, it almost looks as though we planned it, but we have talked to each other enough that that uh, I know how impressive his work is. So I'm. Uh, going to talk about um, how, indeed, uh, domain experts, you know, physicians and researchers in, in, in neuroscience can come together with people like me uh, who, indeed, come very strongly from computer engineering and computer systems side. And our particular and very strong collaborators are Mayo. And of course, I can easily say we at Illinois, or people like me, we lack the domain knowledge. Um, we can always go and take a piece of data. We can go and say, well, the previous engineer who did this work got 99.5% accuracy, and my student got 99.55 or 99.97. And trust me, there will be an engineering journal that presents that and, and, and uh, publishes it. But soon, I think, some, quite some years ago, when, when Yoga was uh, still young and joined our group, we, uh, <clears throat> we decided that's not the way to go. We really need to go and talk to physicians. And, and fortunately, at that time, Mayo came to Illinois looking for an engineering partner. And from then, uh, and this was one of the early projects that we went to. Uh, Greg Worrell at, at Mayo, uh, Yoga spent some time in his lab trying to understand and be able to predict seizures. The data was complex, but it was not big data. There were five or six or eight dogs uh, who had epilepsy. And we didn't think that this was uh, a simple problem. It was very complex data, had to be put together, as Jeff said, very, in a very clever manner. And for those dogs, uh, Yoga was able to predict that um, they would have seizures, I think, probably about an hour in advance. And the complaint at the time was, of course, you don't have a large sample size. And of course, since then, they moved on from dogs I think it went up to 100. But you can see what, what we effectively did. We um, could go and take the, our expertise, or our expertise that we were building, and uh, uh, the domain expertise that our Mayo uh, physicians were offering. And over a period of time, through hard work and constant discussions, we were able to build a bridge that now spans not just neurodegenerative diseases, but, but uh, pharmacogenomics, cardiology, and, and uh, more recently, uh, skin diseases, skin cancer, and things like that. And, and underlying, of course, there are core methods. And uh, the domain knowledge is very important because it allows us to build compact models for which uh, the data and the domain are really suited. And using these compact models, uh, you don't need a large amount of data. And to me, other than imaging, in the medical world, there isn't a huge amount of uh, data on any one topic if you want it to be complete. You know, I frequently have people tell me, we've got 20,000 patients. And you go there, maybe they are about, uh, 1,500 patients for whom the data is complete. So you have to extract enough information. You have to sort of substitute something else. The something else that we substitute is domain knowledge that allows us to build very effective models. And what I'm, uh, <coughs> here, is a, here is an example 
I mean, which effectively says, what are the promises that the uh, that we sort of make to our students, our colleagues, to invite them to come and address this kind of a problem, and what are the the major research gaps on the on the on the uh, 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 here you have effectively a sample of the kind of data. Um, genomic data is large, very large. On the other hand, when you take it in its totality, it doesn't always reveal uh, or, or provide such personal information as you expect. Then you have proteomics data, that means the proteins, the metabolites, they really start, at least in our experience, to divulge more and more about the individual patient's chemistry, how they, in fact, handle a drug, how they, in fact, react to a particular situation. And then in the brain, there are neurosignals and neuroimages. And neuroimages, in, indeed, uh, they are, that's the largest amount of data which needs to be looked at. And I think if you look at one area that's been looked at and studied very well, is applying deep learning uh, to imaging. And it's, it's a technology that is, uh, I, I'd say, is starting to plateau because we know how to use it very well. It's a lot of hard work, but it does produce good results. When you combine that with um, uh, processing, computing expertise, where you're using uh, specialized hardware, specialized software, FPGAs and special purpose engines like uh, uh, GPUs coming from NVIDIA, uh, you, we start to see a domain-driven, what we call deep analytics. And the goal, our goal is at the, at the highest level to extract what I call actionable intelligence. And I'll tell you um, how that word came about, at least uh, in my experience. Uh, <coughs> in in uh, many years ago, I think I I was at Mayo, giving I think one of my first talk in front of uh, uh, many of these physicians, particularly the bunch of surgeons, and they only meet you at seven o'clock. Some for engineers, a very unearthly hour, <laughs> and you you have to show up because uh, come seven thirty or so, they all disappear to go and start operating on people. So I, I was, uh, I thought, well, what would they know about what I'm talking about? Really, I must make the big claim. And I st started to say, we can go and analyze the, the genome. We can go and extract out mutations. And this uh, guy uh, put up his head. He said, well, put up his hand. And he said, you know, you can give me a 1,000 mutations. It wouldn't make a difference unless you tell me one that I can act on. Um, it really. Uh, made me think that, yes, I think we should, we have to get the right amount of information to the surgeon, to the physician, that they can really use. And that's where I think the tough engineering problem is. Biomarkers uh, in personalized medicine, can you study a whole bunch of patients? And of course, a whole bunch may only mean 1,500 in, in the, the largest depression data that there is is a cohort about slightly less than 2,000 patients worldwide, Asia, Europe, US. So using that data, can you, when a new patient arrives, uh, go and say, well, for this particular individual, using the metabolomics information, the genomic information of that patient, predict whether the drug, uh, say an SSRI drug, will work for that patient. And to what extent? If you can say it'll work with uh, an 80% chance for that patient, it's really great. If it is going to be only work with a 10% chance, then your uh, engine should be smart enough to go and find another drug that is at least effective at the close to the 80% level. And can we move to that kind of a treatment? So here, we're not changing the drug, but we're using really the patient's chemistry. 
And similarly, in surgical guidance, you know, uh, Jeff talked eloquently about uh, the issues in epilepsy. An important issue is uh, can you, how well can you identify the region of the brain that a surgeon should excise in order for epileptic seizures to stop? And these are people who, of course, as uh, uh, Jeff is the expert, as he said, well, the drugs haven't worked, right? Um, <clears throat> so can we, uh, looking at the, at the signals coming from the brain, without have the patient having seizures, seizures, and of course we know that this is an epileptic patient, if by the time we wait for the patient to have seizures, you have to have maybe two or three weeks, maybe a few, a uh, couple more in the hospital, very expensive, very difficult for the patient. But could we really use the signals, uh, you know, pre-epileptic signals, pre-seizure -pre signals, in order to identify the region that should be removed? And how do you verify that? Indeed, this is uh, uh, work that yoga has been working on. So bringing that together, the, the core of that, is the, the uh, bringing together of the data. How do you fuse and how do you integrate the data? And in a way that the data itself uh, gives you some intelligence to start with, meaning what level of intelligence can you extract from the data? And then what level of intelligence can you extract by working with uh, domain experts? In this case, uh, in the case of epilepsy, uh, uh, the, the uh, a neurologist who specialize in this, they have insights. Can we actually use that insight combined with the insight that we derive from the data to, uh, 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 to extract actionable intelligence? And our strong interest is can I really build systems software systems, hardware systems uh, that are sufficiently small because you, in the end you want that to sit on a, patient, on a, a physician's desk uh, and easily usable. I, don't, I, I won't claim that we've solved that problem at the moment, but I think that's where, uh, that's our real goal, that's where we are, we are going. The tool set that we have that addresses, starts to address it, and I'll discuss this in the, uh, uh, with, the, with the example of brain analytics, it has at the bottom, and I think uh, uh, this is indeed the very fundamental aspect with which uh, many people, either they ignore or use, you know, I have to be careful of, of the statisticians in this. Uh, uh, just, just normalize the data, put it together, and, uh, uh, and, and often they come back and say there is no signal. So, and it's not that they are wrong. Statistically, they are correct. But what they haven't done, uh, and what we try to do, is to use domain knowledge to say, how do I fuse these data? How do I really stack the data together? in a way that uh, through, by the end of the analysis of the data analytics, you have some intelligence that you have extracted from the data. The second step, and this is sort of depicted as a set of drawers which contains these great tools, um, is uh, what we call, these are the domain models that are medical knowledge and rich discrimination models. So that allow us, for example, the example that I gave of uh, uh, classification of the seizure onset zone, that allows us to develop a first order uh, estimate of where the seizure onset zone might be. The next level is you, you have a model, you want to make some decision based on this model. And the example that I have here is the progression for example, of a major depressive disorder. Can you sort of say who, uh, based on the drug, 
that's being given, are they going to get better or are they going to get worse? If you can predict that they're going to get worse, maybe early on uh, the, the psychiatrist will change the drug. Um, now, you, you, you have these decision models just like the physician does. I mean, the, the physician has, sees the patient the, the, um, based on new information that he or she has, information from the, uh, from the uh, patient themselves. They go and reinforce the process. They decide to make changes. They enhance it, always having, of course, some uncertainty. And the key to their final decision making is that the physician, I mean, we all, we all make decisions under uncertainty. We, you know, we sort of classify things and we know that uh, uh, there are different chances of what might happen. But in face of this uncertainty, we make a decision. Similarly, our, uh, the end uh, part of this process is to make the decision in face of the uncertainty and then determine, of course, uh, if you have ground truth, you see uh, how good that decision is. Uh, if not, I mean, we, have, we uh, work with the physicians to see, in fact, does the, does the decision when the, the machine augments the physician's knowledge, does the overall decision get better? And of course, you know, <coughs> if uh, we didn't have success, I wouldn't be standing here telling you that this is a great process. But it's, a, it's an ongoing process. I think there's innovation to be done in every aspect of it. And as you can see, that an example that I've given here uh, is, the, uh, is the brain. So I want to give two examples. In fact, one I've, I've uh, talked about a little bit on epilepsy. And the second is uh, uh, broadly Alzheimer's uh, dementia-related diseases. And I have a... Uh, personal anecdote describing that that sort of drives home how important uh, and how debilitating and I think how expensive these diseases are. Um, to date, there is no real uh, drug. In fact, uh, I, I, I take that back. Yoga just shared with me a, a BBC online uh, report that says uh, Biogen has come up with a drug for uh, uh, Alzheimer's. Right, uh, <clears throat> and um, you know, a few months ago, or maybe a year or so ago, they had uh, announced that they are giving up on this drug, but uh, they changed their mind, and they have announced that the drug now works because they have done new analysis with the data that reveals that there are ways in which they can make the drug work. Of course, the the snippet is short, so. Um, I, I don't know exactly how that story would pan out. Um, I've uh, um, one, my, uh, one of my mentors from Stanford, uh, Ed McCluskey, he died of dementia a few couple of years ago. Extremely uh, um, energetic man <coughs> who was active almost right to the end. And one day he called me uh, when I was in the Bay Area and he said, Ravi, come over. And I said, of course, I'm coming over, Ed. And uh, the next word that he had said, I have dementia. And of course, you know, my wife was with me. We went to see him. Uh, the next day he was admitted to a nursing home because it was very difficult to, uh, to, to manage him. And uh, um, it turned out that uh, when I went to the nursing home, maybe about eight, six or eight months later, uh, Gene Armdahl, I mean, I think a great a computer pioneer, was in the, in the room next to him. Of course, you know, I mean, I went and said hi to Gene, but I don't think it mattered to him who, who I was or anything. Uh, Ed barely recognized me. And of course, it, great pain for his children, extraordinary expense to keep him and, and manage him in the nursing home. His first question 
was. I mean, he knew that I did data analytics. He says, couldn't statisticians have predicted this 10 years ago that I would have dementia? Um, you know, I mean, at that time, I didn't know uh, as much about it. But it, it sort of uh, drives home as to these are very expensive diseases. The, it's not just the US population that is aging. It is, uh, you know, European population, Japanese. I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a disease that's going to hit, and it is hitting uh, people without really a whole lot of uh, uh, notice. And it sort of grows on you. Um, so let's see. So I, I, I want to just share with you um, what we think might be an approach. And I, 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 uh, I paraphrase it in that sense, because I don't know that uh, uh, we know exactly how to go about it. The uh, um, medication for memory enhancement, behavioral symptoms, and so on, of course, there are a lot of these kinds of medication in the popular press, but uh, very few that have been uh, uh, augmenting lifestyle, increasing cognitive resilience. All of these are possible, but none have come about. And they haven't quite come about because by the time people are diagnosed with Alzheimer's, they're already in a very, in, in, a, in a moderate or serious uh, decline situation. So by that time, you know, the picture I have is that the brain is already clouded. And it's too hard for any drug that you give to wash it out while keeping the neurons alive and, and healthy underneath the amyloids and, uh, and, and all the other stuff that's, that's grown on top of, our, of the brain. So it's too late, and that's uh, often what at least the pharmacologists uh, uh, that, that uh, we work with say uh, uh, why the drugs have failed. Um, so if we could diagnose earlier, sufficiently earlier, would we actually say when the person is 50 that, hey, there is a chance that uh, your chance of getting uh, Alzheimer's or a dementia-related illness is uh, 10 times higher than the, than the average population. It's possible that at that time, and with that kind of information, drugs could be engineered, drugs could be developed. So, it's a <clears throat> indeed the challenge that uh, Bill Gates threw out, I think, a couple of years ago, was that if we can predict 10 years earlier. I don't know how, whether Yoga uh, will do 10 years before he graduates, but uh, I think he's at uh, four or five years. So maybe he can, you know, if, we'll take a vote whether he should really uh, um, I should hold off his graduation till he exceeds five years. Um, but really, that's where I think uh, the, the, uh, the issues are. The medical care costs are very high. Um, so our approach, again, I think, is, uh, is, is what has sort of become, a, at least in our group, the characteristics approach. You use uh, uh, graphical models. These are domain-based models. Um, and then, effectively, what the domain-based model, what a graphical model says, is that I know approximately how the disease evolves. I have small amounts of data to describe this. And because, and, and the lack of data, I augment by my knowledge of the domain. Now, based on this, I, I have a way of determining how the disease is evolving. And then I have to make a decision. The, the graphical models already have uncertainty built in them. Now if you use, if you want to make a decision, I don't care how uh, I make the decision, but that's a very quick decision that one needs to make. And that is nicely offered by deep learning. So my prediction is that going forward, increasingly, we will resort 
to Bayesian augmented deep learning models, often called Bayesian deep learning. And Bayesian deep learning has many, many, many facets emerging in theory. But this at least uh, uh, offers a chance, both in the long term and in the short term, to, uh, uh, to give a uh, uh, early uh, indication of what, the, uh, what are the chances and what is the trajectory of, uh, of Alzheimer's of a person. Um, and, the, and the important thing here is you may or may not have evolutionary data, meaning you know, people with Alzheimer's don't always come back. They are very difficult to, to study over a period of time. So you somehow have to use some other information in order to augment this. And the approach is to say, I have uh, behavioral information. I have information at the baseline about what the person's brain looks like, how much there is, uh, how much amyloid, how much tau, the volume of the brain, the structural uh, changes in the brain. And now I could use other information, such as uh, the demographics, the clinical health of the patient, which are known to, uh, uh, to sort of decline as the cognition uh, declines. Now, very different kinds of data. Can we sort of do the magic of combining these data, data sets, and being able to then predict uh, effectively how old am I? You know, I might be 60 years old, but my brain might indeed be 75 years old. So can I, can I make those predictions? And what our early results indeed show that that kind of a prediction, by combining multiple types of data, even though they were not derived uh, from the same patient and at different times, but they provide different types of intelligence. We constantly combine this kind of experience. So could we make the machine indeed combine this kind of an experience? So um, you know, trying to bring this together, um, what we are, I said that my primary, our group's primary interest is in systems innovation. A few years ago, we persuaded NSF to fund, you know, Illinois has this uh, history of building machines. And we uh, persuaded NSF that uh, both the computer scientists and the biologists, that it was a good idea to let us go and build another machine, which will have at its core uh, graphical models combined with deep learning. And uh, uh, traumatic brain disorders, early predictions of seizures, Alzheimer's, I mean, neurodegenerative diseases, uh, where there isn't always, in all respects, large amounts of data, um, may be a very good candidate for this. Well, um, they, they supported this work. And indeed, I think we just Last August, uh, the contract ended. And of course, you know, we have to declare it success. We have a machine. It does, in fact, take data and produce, produces results and looks and can do a large number of these uh, um, of, of patients, uh, different types of data. It's been applied to uh, a, a few diseases. And we are in the running now to go and build the next generation of this machine to see uh, uh, whether we can do better. So it's a good place for me to stop um, and happy to take questions. If time for one to two quick questions before we take a break. So as you mentioned, we don't have a lot of big data sets for dementia. Like maybe the biggest one is Dementia Bank, but it's still not very big, right? Uh, I'm sorry? 
Uh, I'm talking about the data sets and that we don't have very deep data sets. So if you want to apply like deep learning methods, it definitely doesn't work well because we don't have very deep data sets. So I just wanted to know your idea about to expand how to expand the data set. Like uh, if we combine different data sets but in different languages. Like if we have one data set for dementia but it is in French and combining it with one other data set in English. So what do you think? Like is it going to work well? I think it's a good question. I can tell you our experience. Um, uh, not with, with uh, dementia, but with uh, diabetes data in Singapore. Um, in Singapore, you have physicians coming from many different countries. They, they are Europeans, uh, uh, English, uh, Indians, Malays, and, and we went and uh, I thought it would be a slam dunk. I mean, nobody had quite analyzed this data, and we can, but the way that, that each, uh, uh, nationality or where they come from, they express themselves for the same disease is quite different. Um, so what we had to do was to extract out uh, very painfully uh, the information, train the model to be able to differentiate automatically uh, whether it's a, a, a Malay or a, a Indian from the south of India versus the north of India in uh, so many. but but. It, it worked. Once, you, once we uh, uh, broke it down, it worked. And in fact, they're still using it. So I think it's possible. There was emphasis on hardware, has to work on the desktop, FPGA. We built a machine. I mean, I'm not sure I understand uh, why, why, why the focus on hardware. You can work in the cloud. You, I mean, so that's uh, it. Doesn't you mention something has to sit on the physician? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I mean, oh. Yeah. So, okay. so I, that's. I, I can. Point. I can. Let, yeah. Indeed, a very good question. I would love for everything to go and sit on Amazon or Google Cloud or what, what not. But the reality of today is that. Uh, you have a bunch of algorithms, and let me just give an example of uh, uh, genomics and, and variant calling. Uh, you have, uh, you use what is called pair HMM, I mean, hidden Markov models. And the, the, uh, the reason you use hidden Markov models is there is some things that you know, and there are a few things that you don't know. So, so uh, uh, and you have to predict what you don't know based on what you know, because you don't know exactly where this, this pattern that you have in your hand will fit. You can do that on the cloud. And the best that you, we could do or anybody could do could be a, a few hours. Having specialized hardware change that to under 30 minutes. And, uh, as, as I speak, I think Amazon offers FPGAs. Uh, you know, Azure, in fact, one of my students was there uh, last year. They've started to have uh, FPGAs. IBM's clouds includes uh, opportunities to put FPGAs. So uh, it's no longer quite that the cloud is the cloud that it was five years ago. Uh, they offer, of course, they've been offering uh, uh, GPUs for quite some time. And they're well integrated. Intel does, IBM does. So how you bring all these things together now becomes an important question. How do you schedule it so that you can take advantage of these uh, heterogeneous components? Um, and why I say the, uh, a box on the physician's desk, I think, uh, Every physician that I talk to wants an AI box on their desk. Now, whether we give them a box that's a virtual box, only actually displays things, or indeed it does some real local computing, I think is, a, is an open question. I suspect, just like we have laptops, 
they will be much smarter laptops, programmable laptops that could be, that are machine learning driven. That, I mean, you know, will be uh, on physician's desks a few years from now. And I'm very interested in brain health and neurodegenerative diseases. And so this very, year's talk speaks deeply to me. My question is, is um, do any of these other things that for wellness incorporate into the model uh, and, and does that help with the prediction model uh, for if someone were to get Alzheimer's? Very good question. In fact, Sabu is here somewhere. There he is. One of the things that uh, his uh, research is doing, yeah, I can, he's in that corner. Yeah. <laughs> um, one of the things that he has done is to say, I have information on a, on a person's brain at a baseline. I really need to predict in time how things will happen. I can't go and keep doing MRI because the, maybe the she or he doesn't show up. I mean, it's, it's too expensive. But I do have uh, their clinical wellness information. You know, their demographics, we can do blood tests and all that. And it turns out, and this is domain knowledge, that, um, that the, the, uh, uh, as their uh, brain declines, as their cognition declines, that's also indicated in these other measures. So by combining these two, this is where I said two di independent, two different data sets, giving, extracting different intelligence, but AI, uh, at least the techniques that we are inventing, allow us to put this, these two uh, apparently different pieces of information together. So here, wellness information is extremely important because very few people have evol significant evolutionary information, especially starting from, you know, 50 years old or something. Possible? Yeah, yeah. You know, we just, I think, uh, so made a little hole in the surface. So very good. Yeah, keep going at it. Wonderful. With that, we're going to take a thank you, Dr. I appreciate it. <laughs> With that, I uh, wanted to introduce, oh, there he is, he's hiding behind the pillar. Uh, I want to introduce Dr. Brian Crum uh, from the Mayo Clinic. Welcome, Brian. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Um, it's a pleasure being here. I, I, I appreciate it. Usually I'm talking to a room full of neurologists or students in a stuffy lecture hall, and this is uh, very refreshing. And the uh, first couple hours have been uh, quite impressive. Um, and so I'm, I'm very happy to be here and talk a little bit about uh, clinical applications of AI. So just for some background, I'm a neurologist. I trained at Mayo Clinic. My clinical practice is mostly neuromuscular disease, so I see ALS patients patients with Lou Gehrig's disease. Uh, some of you may know about that. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about how we try to use AI in, in solving some clinical problems. Uh, I wouldn't say we've solved them, but how we've kind of approached them. Uh, and that may be applicable to other diseases or other um, conditions as well. The other thing I spend a lot of time and probably more time thinking about is access. And um, that means access to mainly our outpatient practice at Mayo Clinic. Uh, Mayo Clinic's a little place about five and a half hours west of here, uh, through all of our sites in Jacksonville, Phoenix, and our health system. We see one to two million patients a year, um, and so we have a lot of uh, needs for access, and typically that means I pick up the phone and I call somebody between the hours of eight and five, and I give them some information, and we schedule a face-to-face -face visit several weeks or even months later. Um, and so we are... Uh, trying to get with the program a little bit, uh, move to more digital, uh, more self-help, self-scheduling options. We'll talk a little bit about that too. So I'm gonna kinda weave both of these things together uh, in the next 20 minutes. And I have my contact information's at the end too, so if you have questions, grab me today or shoot me an email. Um, so we're gonna talk a little bit about ALS and, and the clinical problems we're, we're trying to solve. Uh, and uh, also shift gears, and think about how do we uh, schedule appointments at Mayo Clinic and uh, how can we use AI to do that. So just briefly, 
Um, ALS or Lou Gehrig's disease is a, is a fatal disorder. It's a bad disease. There's no cure. Uh, clearly, uh, there's desire to find a cure, find a treatment. Um, but what we're approaching is um, really not that. It, it's progression of the disease and counseling the patient. So patients develop progressive weakness. It's in the arms, it's in the legs. It affects speech and swallowing and breathing. Life expectancy is somewhere around three to five years, but it varies a lot. Um, and I think that's one of the challenges in this disease. It typically starts in one spot, and it spreads. Um, and how it spreads um, is somewhat predictable, uh, but how fast it goes and where it goes next, if you're a patient, is quite variable. There are fast progressors, which may die, they may die within months, or very slow progressors who may live 10 years or longer. Um, and how do you figure that out early in the disease course is a challenge. And patients can look very different. When I'm in ALS clinic and we see maybe six patients in the morning, uh, they all look very different. You could see a patient who um, can't talk or eat. They have a feeding tube, but they're up walking around. And you wouldn't know anything's wrong with them unless you sat down and had lunch with them. And then there are the flip side, the patients who have severe weakness in arms or legs, but they're talking fine, they're eating fine. Um, and so the variability of that disease and how it progresses and how it presents poses a challenge to a clinician to help understand what's going to happen to the patient. Um, so this was a question, I, I gave this talk to our department a couple weeks ago, and the clinical scenario really is, you're seeing a patient in your clinic, you've diagnosed them with this bad disease, um, and they want to know what's going to happen. Now sometimes, early on, patients may or may not really want to know that, but eventually, in a chronic disease, there's value in having some information. Um, and we as neurologists and ALS neurologists, we know a lot about what generally happens to patients. But when they start asking us specifics, we get a little wishy-washy because it's hard to predict. And most of the time I say to patients, you know, it's really hard to predict in one person what's going to happen to you. But here's generally what we see in this disease. So when I asked my colleagues, most people were comfortable with sort of a general timeline. But really nobody was comfortable giving that patient really solid answers on what's going to happen to them over time. So as we think about progression of the disease, and really the goal was, how could we educate a patient or their family on what's going to happen to them over time? You know, ALS has been around for a long, long time. We have lots of data. Um, you know, what's going to happen to them? Um, and being able to sit there and talk to a patient or allow a patient to even interact with a tool that could give them information about their prognosis and progression. So when you look at ALS, there's, there's uh, a lot of data. And a lot of the data is based on a functional rating scale score. Um, and uh, this is a pretty standard thing. Every time you come to the clinic, we collect the data. Um, we have a score. So 48 is normal. So a patient might have a score of 42 or 35 or 37. The problem is it really varies because there's so many domains here. You may have patients who can't walk, have the same score of a patient who can't talk or eat. Same score, very, very different uh, quality of life, very, very different problems. There are some things within here that are quite meaningful. So PEG is a feeding tube. Uh, Non-invasive invasive ventilation might be a mask that helps with breathing. Uh, you know, not on a ventilator or things like that, but may need help with breathing or may be limited because of their breathing ability. Need assistance with dressing, using a wheelchair, things like that. And we know that the progression in ALS is downward. Uh, and this is just a graph showing if you, if you measured that score over time, what would generally happen? Um, the problem is if I tell a patient, you know, you are a 42 today and you're going to be a 38 when I see you in six months, you know, that's not as helpful as, you know, what's really going to happen to me, Doc? You know, can I keep working? Do I need to remodel my house? Do I need to purchase equipment? There are other staging scales, and I'm not going to go into a lot of detail. Um, the ALS FRS is a score that is, is pretty standard. In most ALS clinics, that's what you, that's what you uh, record. But people have taken different swings at this and looked at different ways to you know, stage ALS. Some scales really are heavily weighted on the beginning of the disease and when things start happening. And then the other scales are weighted on the back end when you actually lose function. So you can be a certain score and having weakness and having weakness and having weakness and then when you need a wheelchair, all of a sudden you have a different score. So that score really doesn't represent the continuum of the disability in the disease. 
So most of the work has been done to, to take a bunch of ALS patients and take the data and take the functional rating scale score or survival, how long do people live, and figure out what factors predict progression, fast or slow. Um, and when we look at clinical studies of drugs, these are the outcome measures that are generally used. How long do people live? You know, that's tough to do a quick study in because you have to follow them for longer. But what happens to their functional rating scale score over time? And if your drug impacts that in a statistically significant way, then it might work in the disease. Uh, so that's, again, kind of the gold standard. Um, and this is my desk, and I don't print everything and kill lots of trees. I sort of cringe to show this because, you know, people say, wow, you really went a library and printed those off? What the heck? So, uh, but that, that's a lot of work has been done. And, and we know a lot about ALS. So if I see a patient and they have certain factors, older, or maybe they have a faster initial progression, it takes about a year to get a diagnosis on average from when you start having hand weakness and you go to your family doctor and you go to orthopedic surgeon or you go somewhere else and eventually you progress and the doctors become smarter and they say, Yee, maybe you need to see a neurologist. The neurologist says, I think you have ALS. That takes about a year. So if it takes you six months to get there, that means you're probably quicker. But it depends. Where do you live? You know, maybe you live somewhere that you have better access to care. So that may not always be true. But there are a number of factors that people have looked at. Um, and nowadays, using bigger data, what's called a PROACT database, which has um, thousands of patients with ALS that has been put together based on clinical studies that have been done on uh, therapeutics. So a lot of the data that's collected in these clinical studies has been pooled together. Uh, and people can get at this. It's, it's publicly available. And so you can get tons of data on ALS patients and how they progress over time. Um, and so many studies have used that data and, again, tried to model this. They've looked at survival or decline in the score. Um, uh, and, and there has been some look at impairment um, in, in functions. And, and that's clearly what we wanted to focus on is not so much the score, but what happens to the patient day to day, what happens. A couple of years ago, there was a contest um, focused on predicting the decline in that functional rating scale score. So $50,000 were given to the winners. There were two winners um, and, and a number of submissions uh, to try to take PROACT data um, and develop a model that predicted best how patients progress through their disease. Um, and, and I think the most interesting thing to me about this was, and you probably can't see here, but um, the two methods at one were over here, and then they asked a number of clinicians with uh, ALS expertise to try to try to predict, and they were they were much worse than the models. So it makes me think. You know, I think I know what I'm doing, um, and maybe I do, uh, but I probably could be better. Uh, in addition, others are doing this, and it's publicly available. This is a website that is for physicians, but it's on the web. It's on the web. Anybody can get to it. Um, and it tells you how long will you live, or what is the likelihood of your, your lifespan with ALS. So I plugged in my information, eight data points. How old are you? When were you diagnosed? Um, things like that. I plugged in those eight data points, and this is my graph. If I was diagnosed today, and I had had the symptoms for about a year, I can go in here if I want, and this will tell me uh, what's, what's the likelihood of my survival over time. Um, so these things are publicly available for patients. Now, I don't use this. I, I don't advocate this. Uh, I think these kind of discussions need to be had with, with providers. Uh, but the bottom line is that these kind of tools are out there. So um, as I had struggled with this for, for some time, I, I met th this fellow here, Tom Rolliter. Yeah, he came to Mayo. Uh, he was um, really a systems operation engineer, PhD. Uh, and he presented data on modeling emergency departments. And, you know, the concept was here's an emergency room, tons of data, patients in, patients out, labs, CT, MRI, et cetera. Uh, model the ED so that you could leverage different things. What if we change staffing? What if we improve our speed and triage? You know, what does that have an effect uh, in the emergency room? And I thought, you know, maybe we could do that in ALS. Um, and so I talked to him. And, and, you know, in fact, there were others looking at this and trying to predict uh, progression of different diseases. Um, and as I kind of think about, I have kids that like to play SimCity. I'm sure nobody here ever plays that. But 
uh, you know, it was like, could we create what this disease would look like? Can we model it? Um, and so uh, it all starts with the data, as we heard this morning. Um, and, and in the 90s even, early 2000s, we created a, a sort of data repository. It's not at all like what you guys have. This is like, here's some discrete data we want to capture on patients, and someday maybe we'll use it. But if we don't collect it, we'll never be able to do this. Um, so we started doing this. Uh, so when our patients come every three months, this is like a nine-page form, and all the different subspecialists who see patients enter information in here. And do they fill it out completely? Anybody want to guess? No. Do I fill it out completely? Mm, not always. Uh, clinicians are busy. Uh, and if you rely on them to enter data uh, on their clinical day, you're going to be disappointed. Um, we found out a lot of free text, and so we had to mine free text to do what we were going to do. Uh, but we had these standard tools uh, that allowed us to do a lot of this work. So the goal really was, could we estimate for a patient or for their family, their caregivers, um, what their course would look like? Um, not so much just their score. The score is not as helpful as really what we decided to call toll gates. Certain critical points of the disease where things happen that are important. And we um, really got that by talking to patients, by talking to other providers in our ALS clinic to say, what are those important points? We may not be able to get everything out of the data, but, but where should we start? Um, and then could we, could we develop this tool? Uh, could we understand what equipment or what devices were needed? Could we understand when we should see the patient back next? See patients every three months. Why? Because that seemed like what we should do. There's no data behind that, but maybe this tool could help us understand, you know, maybe four months, five months, six months. We have trouble getting patients in. I'm, I'm sure it's shocking that, you know, there's, there's just not enough capacity. We, we can't get all the patients in. So if there's a thing we could do to spread out visits and create more capacity, that would be a good thing. And could the tool get smart? So every time a patient comes back or every time we collect more data, could that tool get better and better and better so that when you present in three months, the tool adjusts a little bit and says, based on where you are now, actually, I think this is where you're going to go. And even in between times, as, as you talked about here, are there other pieces of data we could collect for the patients at home? So I, I'm a clinician. There's no way I could do any of this, and that's why I'm, I'm really happy to be here among all you smart people. We'll help figure all this stuff out. Uh, but, but this work really uh, was done with the help of a number of data scientists. Um, Cal, who is listed here, couldn't be here today, but he was part, I think, of the planning committee of, of this meeting. Uh, and it's really him that I should thank for me being here. Uh, but a number of individuals at different sites who brought different skills uh, to trying to put this together. I must have done some. I'm not done. There we go. There's more slides. So again, we, in a way, I wouldn't say we created some of these. These are, some of these um, toll gates are really part of the standard scale, uh, but we did modify it. We sort of created our own in a way, um, and, and we kind of felt these were critical events, important to patients, important to providers, um, and uh, really based on expert opinion. So uh, we've really defined this, and then what we needed to do is figure out when patients came to clinic, where were they? Where were they at all these different points in time? Um, again, the hope was, oh yeah, this will just live in these forms, and we'll just find the discrete data points, and, and it'll be easy, and it turned out it wasn't. Again, a lot of um, natural language processing to figure out how to take that free text and convert it into these toll gates. Um, and so a lot of work was done there, which I can't really talk about now due to time, happy to talk about it. Um, and then that was ba um, validated. So you know, the tool went. Predicted, here's where the toll gates were. We go back and look, and was it right? And modify. Um, so that we did a lot of work to try to get to that. Um, we didn't have a ton of patients, you know, about 500 patients, uh, multiple visits over sometimes a year or so. You know, this disease progresses. So patients don't keep coming back over and over and over again for 10 years. We usually see them a couple of times. And we are seeing them in this clinic um, sort of sometimes through the disease. So one of the downsides of this is that we caught them at the point they came to our clinic. We didn't catch them at the time they came to Mayo Clinic. We didn't catch them at the time they saw their neurologist at home or when the diagnosis was made. 
Uh, and again, we'll get into how we try to solve for some of that. So this, this was just our, our data. Um, and again, I'm going to gloss through some of this. Um, but essentially, patients, as expected, got worse over time. Uh, that we, we knew that, but we had some idea about um, ultimately, you know, how fast did certain things change as a, for the global, all the patients. Um, and we spent some time looking at probabilities uh, that certain things would happen. And again, the group of patients. Uh, so when would people maybe uh, develop significant arm weakness or leg weakness or need a wheelchair or need a feeding tube or need help with breathing? So we could get to some general ideas of, you know, some timelines for patients. Um, but really, again, that's, you know, kind of where we were. What we need to do is get a little more personalized or individualized to say, you know, you, you know, Mr. Smith, you have ALS, you're 55 years old, here's your symptoms, here's your data, what do we think is going to happen with you? And so in ALS, we tend to break up the disease depending a lot on how it begins. Does it start in the face? Does it start in the arm? Does it start in the leg? Um, and so these phenotypes, if you will, of ALS, we tried to break down and say, you know, if you were of a certain phenotype, how did you progress through these toll gates? Clearly, if your speech was affected early on, you're going to more likely lose the ability to speak sooner than if it starts, for example, in your leg. So when we look at global data of ALS patients and it says, well, six months before you lose speech, that's not really helpful because you've got one subset that may take three months and some subsets that might take three years. So we tried to break it down by the, again, the sort of phenotype of ALS so we could be a little bit better about telling an individual patient what might happen to them over time. Um, so, you know, clearly there's some information out of here that is useful. Um, we published this, and if you want to look at more of the details of the methods, it's here, and there's no way you can read that, I'm sure, so I'm happy to discuss that or email me. Um, but we realized, you know, this was a small data set. Uh, we didn't have a ton of follow-up. We didn't catch the patients early on in the disease course. So this was kind of a proof of concept. Could we do this? Um, and so then we had to take uh, the next step as we thought about this. We realized that the ALS FRS, this, this scale, uh, is really the gold standard, and so most people measure that across really throughout the world. Um, so could we use that and try to map that into our toll gate system? And so that's what we're currently doing now is, is trying to take that really standard data, map it into our toll gates, and show progression over time. And again, I'm not really going to show a lot of this stuff in the interest of time, um, but arrive at just the idea that we're taking this standard data, trying to map it into what we feel like are more clinically meaningful toll gates with the ability to actually hopefully pull in other data. So this gets into the repository of other things in other places, EMG data, lab data, genetics, and create models on patients. All right, now I'm going to shift gears in the last one to two minutes. Um, Mayo Clinic uh, alluded to earlier today, patients say, why can't I schedule my appointments online? Why can't I do it online? I can do everything else. Um, so we spent a lot of time thinking about how can we at Mayo Clinic um, really replicate some of what we do, thinking about access and appointments uh, with AI and machine learning. Um, and I have a poster uh, this afternoon talking about what we did in our Dizzy Clinic, but other clinics. Uh, the, the concept is patients fill out some kind of questionnaire or give us some kind of information. Uh, we utilize uh, a tool which can then say, this patient should come to Mayo Clinic and they should get these things scheduled. Um, and so that's kind of what we've started doing on the front end of scheduling for, say, brand new patients that want to come to Mayo Clinic. Um, in our consult practice in neurology, we've tried to utilize tools that predict how much capacity do we need. Uh, right now, a lot of it is just who's around. Um, but we need to be a bit smarter about understanding, you know, what capacity do we need as a department to meet the, meet the demand. Um, and then ultimately looking for um, a more, I would say, user-friendly way, streamlined way for patients to go online, put in information, and schedule an appointment. Uh, novel concept, I'm sure. But uh, in our practice, people say, oh, that'll never work because it's a complex practice. We see complicated patients, and that's true. But can we get to a point where patients could enter information, we use AI, machine learning, and, and provide to them, here are the options for scheduling. Um, again, I'm not going to go through some of this. It's really just what happens uh, to patients who want to get an appointment uh, at Mayo Clinic. 
this is a decision tree. Uh, we built this. This is one of the easy ones. Uh, this is if you have a brain tumor, you call Mayo Clinic and say I have a brain tumor. Most people at Mayo Clinic would say, you call Mayo Clinic and say I have a brain tumor, well, come on in, we'll see you, you know. But what do you need set up? You need a neurosurgeon. Which neurosurgeon? Which neurologist? MRI, which kind of MRI? Uh, how fast, how urgent? So this kind of uh, algorithm, you know, is, is what we use today. Um, but how can we um, look at patients that have been through the system, learn from that, and understand up front what information drives what's going to happen when you get to Mayo Clinic? And how can we predict that at the front end, what you need, so we can set that up for you? So this is just a quick, um, really, just show of how it flows. But the bottom line is, today, you call, you send online, you get a phone call back. It takes days, sometimes weeks, to figure out, do you get an appointment, and what do you need? Can we speed that up so it takes minutes? And just some examples of what things could look like. You have your phone, put in information, get the appointment. Um, that's, again, using things like AI machine learning, um, trying to eliminate some of the time waste in records and review and things like that. So my last slide, really just thinking about in ALS, um, you know, we have a patient who goes online, thinks they have ALS. Um, they schedule their appointment. They may be able to have a chat, uh, as we saw this morning, um, automated ordering and scheduling of the tests they need based on their symptoms. Uh, we get their information. We consume the outside records that we try to get, and <laughs> sometimes we struggle to get to, but now, uh, with uh, sharing of, re of electronic information, it's better. Um, we utilize uh, voice enabled in our interactions with patients in our electronic health record. Uh, patients can use their own portal, their own app to figure out where to go when they come to Mayo Clinic. And that ALS patient, I can use that tool um, over time to help model what's going to happen to them and, and provide input to them as they progress through the disease. Again, holy grail here is fixing the disease, but for, the, for now, uh, giving them information about what's going to happen with them. Um, so I think that's really the end. I sped through some of that. Uh, again, I'm very happy to be here, share some of this. Uh, take questions now or certainly grab me anytime today. Thank you very much. So we have time for a couple quick questions, if there are any. thought of trying to add a, a remote um, methods of assessing patients physical or speech or other capacities and feeding that into your system so think using remote mod yes yes I think we are uh, uh, sort of taking some steps there but pretty early but definitely um, whether it's speech whether it's movement a lot of those things, yeah, grip strength, our, our rehab docs, they check grip strength every, every appointment. Why couldn't you do that at home? So definitely remote monitoring. You know, these patients, sometimes it's difficult to travel. Um, so we lose patients because they live in Chicago, and it's hard for them to get to Rochester. But they don't maybe need to come to Rochester. So I think this, that could allow us to expand our ability to follow up patients over time. Any other questions? Oh, one more. Oh, sorry. I'm trying to run away. Yeah, uh, <laughs> a more generic question. Uh, what do you think the lifetime expectancy prediction model, uh, to what degree is it so specific that none of them could be uh, reusable for other types of, con uh, other types of conditions? or perhaps just in general. So if you, if every, for every condition we would have something like that, then perhaps somehow it could, could be integrated. So I, 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 I heard about the opposite, that uh, there is calendar age and there is, there is biological age based on telomeres and uh, zillions of other things. So I'm just wondering how easy it is to make these modular and, and uh, look for combinations of diseases. So making this modular a bit, or looking, yeah, for yeah, other, so applying for it into other diseases. Yeah, so for example, if I have a slight um, ALS and perhaps uh, some Alzheimer's suspects and maybe a few other things, uh, the diabetes. Uh, yeah. yeah, so I think that would, be, I mean, we're, we're, yeah, we're at a very, uh, 
early stage, but you're right. I mean, there are other factors that play into like a survival. Right. Uh, and certainly we know in, in ALS, some patients do develop dementia and cognitive problems, or maybe they have heart disease, or they have right. diabetes, right. or they have other medical conditions right. that, you know, what we're doing so far isn't factoring any of that in. Right. Uh, right. Or where do they live? Or are they married or not married? Do they have support systems? Right. There's, there's right. other factors like that that play a role, for sure. But we haven't started putting those into the model. Yeah, I was just wondering if someone else is looking at the, I, it. It seems to me that you got the, I never ever seen so detailed uh, prediction model with what you, have, you, what you have for ALS. So I'm just wondering that the industry in general is, is um, looking for some ways or, or methods for, for making these um, interoperable, yeah. these prediction methods. Yeah, so I, yeah, I think you know, many people are working on their own pieces, and so how to collaborate and connect is one reason I'm glad I'm here. Uh, but yeah, I mean, I think other diseases, there are many other people doing this in other areas. Thank you very much. Okay, thanks. And so our next speaker, uh, she's the last thing between you and lunch, so no pressure. Uh, Dr. Alex Lowe from the University of Illinois uh, and uh, co-founder of a member company of ours here at Matter called BioEffect. So welcome. Thank you so much. So I'm Alex and so excited to be here and tell you a little bit about our open science project. It's called Bioffect. With me today, I have Faraz, who is our software engineer, and also Dr. Ulada, who is gonna be a part of the panel discussion in the afternoon. So the Bioffect project was first conceived in 2015. And that's when fitness trackers such as Fitbit and Apple Watch became popular. So as a psychiatrist, I ask myself, if we can do this for the human body, why can't we do this for the human brain? So the overarching goal of the project is to turn smartphones into fitness trackers for the brain. So when I talk to my patients, I notice that a lot of times they don't necessarily feel comfortable sharing with me their darkest feelings. And even if they do, they may not be able to evaluate these feelings objectively. In addition, they come to see me no more than once or twice a month, but they live with their symptoms every single day. So having a brain fitness tracker that is entirely passive and unobtrusive would address these limitations of existing assessment models. The core technology is a custom-built keyboard that replaces the standard uh, default keyboard and tracks keystroke dynamics metadata in the background as the user continues to use their phone as usual. Notice we only track metadata, we don't track the actual content. So what that means is that we don't track what you type, but how you type it. Then we essentially use um, mathematical models to conduct neuropsychological evaluation without actually having to talk to a person. To give you an intuitive example how this works, imagine as I'm standing here, I also start texting a friend of mine at the same, at the same time. As my attention is divided, I'll be making a lot of mistakes. And if I'm able to catch my mistakes 
then I'll be using the backspace a lot to correct myself. So as you can see, keyboard dynamics metadata could actually tell us a lot about the person's internal neurotech logic group. So now we want to know if this intuition actually works in the real world. We launched the BIAFX study in April 2018 using an app that is freely available on Apple's App Store. And as of August 2019, we've, en we've enrolled more than 1,600 participants and collected more than 18,000 hours of keyboard dynamics, uh, roughly 40 million key presses. And this is really only possible thanks to a new research model called citizen science. So how is citizen science different than traditional research? Citizen science democratizes research with two core features. Feature number one is open participation. What that means is that anyone who lives in the US could be a citizen scientist our project by simply downloading the app onto the iPhone. Second core feature is return of value. We take great pride in providing potentially actionable feedback information on the dashboard back to our citizen scientists so that they can potentially form better insight into the inner workings of their own brains. For example, they can see how many key presses they've entered for that day, and what percent, percentage of those key presses are backspaces or typos, as well as how those key presses are distributed with respect to the time of day. So I'm going to spend the next few minutes and talk about our, uh, some of our findings. So before we launched the study in uh, iOS using the uh, open science model, we actually established feasibility in a small Android pilot in people with bipolar disorder. And these are the features that we use at that time. And the lead author is Dr. Zuleta. Um, so for example, we look at the average time between two key presses, uh, the backspace ratio, the autocorrect, the circadian rhythm, um, the session length, the session count. And as we hypothesized, at least for this pilot, passively collected keyboard dynamics could predict gold standard ratings of mood. And here, because these participants are uh, bipolar disorder, so we have the Young Mania Rating Scale for Mania, and then the Hamilton Depression Rating Scale for Depression. But what's more interesting is that if we look at the significant predictors of mania and depression, we see something very interesting. As we know, when a person is manic, they tend to be more impulsive. So they are probably not checking their messages as much as they probably should. So more severe mania is associated with less backspace. On the other hand, more severe depression is associated with more typos as well as slower typing speed. So I want us to sort of remember these findings because I'm going to come back later when we talk about the iOS. In another paper, we asked the question, if a metric as simple as typing speed instability would actually prospectively predict mood rating. And again, our intuition was correct. Uh, if you compute the instability metric, for the first few days, it would prospectively predict Hamilton depression rating scale a few weeks down the road. Not only keyboard dynamics map onto mood, they also map onto cognition. Here, the domains of cognition are processing speed and set shifting, which is basically the ability of a person to multitask. And they are usually measured using what's called the trail making test. Now, since this is a, um, a meeting about AI, so we have also used deep learning. We have used recurrent neural networks and um, 
convolutional neural networks to model keystroke dynamics and predict mood. So enough about our Android pilot. What I am most excited about is our iOS sample. And I am going to illustrate the analyses using typing speed as an example. But even before we start analyzing the data, if you simply visualize the data, we could see something very interesting. So the x-axis is time of day. So this is midnight here, and uh, noon is here. And the y-axis is each individual day. And we can see that for our citizen scientists on the left, uh, this person has a fairly regular uh, diurnal pattern. On the other hand, the citizen scientist on the right has more of a irregular diurnal pattern. Now, the foundation of understanding uh, typing speed is called the interkey delay, or IKD, and that is the time between two consecutive key presses. Now, what's interesting is that it turns out IKD has a heavy tail distribution regardless of the type of transition. And by transition, I mean whether a character is followed by another character or followed by a backspace, for example. And the reason why there is a heavy tail is because we often pause between periods of typing. And also, we notice that the different transitions tend to have different distributions. The backspace to backspace transition tends to be the fastest. And the character to punctuation transition tends to be the slowest. And this makes a lot of sense if we think about how we type ourselves. And I'm going to skip this one. This is more of a data science uh, nitty gritty. So just to briefly summarize where we are right now. So because of the heavy tail, we can use the median of interkey delay to understand the general typing speed. And then we can use something like the 90th percentile of interkey, interkey delay to understand the pause between typing. And of course, we can also look into session duration as well as uh, typing mistakes, and that is percentage autocorrect per session. So let's look at some results real quick, and I'll wrap up my uh, presentation. So the first thing we notice is that general typing speed has a nonlinear relationship with time of day. We type faster during midday, then we gradually slow down. So the axis is time of day, morning, afternoon, night, and the y-axis is the median interkey delay. The longer the delay, the slower we type. And this, again, makes a lot of sense. In the morning, when we wake up, it takes a few hours for the brain to fully wake up. So that makes sense that we type fastest a couple of hours after we wake up, and then towards the end of the day, we slow down. But what's even more interesting is that there is an age effect and age by time of day interaction. So again, if we compare an average 20-year-old versus an average 45-year-old and an average 70-year-old, we notice that as, uh, as we get older, we tend to type slower. But as we get older, we also exhibit more pronounced slowing at night compared to a younger person. Again, this makes a lot of sense. And this actually has potentially a tremendous amount of implication in people with dementia. And uh, it's called sundowning for people who are uh, familiar with the concept. And in addition to age and um, time of day, we also look into whether there is depression effect on typing speed. And the answer is yes. As we saw earlier in our Android pilot, more severe depression is associated with longer pauses between typing. So in this graph, the y-axis is the 90th percentile interkey delay. So that's the pause between uh, typing. And the x-axis is the uh, severity of depression. And again, this makes a lot of sense because um, patients who are struggling with depression, they often come to me and they say, um, 
they can't seem to concentrate, they can't seem to stay on task. They seem to be more easily distracted. So it makes a lot of sense for us to see longer pauses between uh, periods of typing. And the last result I want, to sh I want to show is that there is also a significant depression effect on typing accuracy and session duration. So again, typing accuracy is measured using the amount of autocorrect. And as you can see, and the more depressed we are, the more autocorrect we get. And that means we're not typing as accurate as, uh, we, as we could. And the, each typing session also gets shorter and shorter as we get more depressed. And that pretty much uh, concludes my presentation. I just want to briefly summarize. I talked about this uh, dream of, of mine, so to speak, that I want to turn everyone's smartphone into a Fitbit for our brains. And secondly, uh, maybe this idea was a little crazy when I first thought about it, but now we are really so inspired uh, by the promising results we, we are seeing so far. And again, I really want to thank all of our citizen scientists because this is only possible because of them. And um, I'm also very happy to report that uh, Biafec will be tested in quite a few NIH-funded uh, studies over the next four to five years. And we're also trying to commercialize this technology uh, as well. And with that, I am stopping here. And thank you so much for your attention. Thank you. So we got a few minutes for some Q&A. Thank you so much, Alex. I find that very, very insightful and quite elegant. One question. One of the first parts you mentioned about the citizen scientist concept was the openness. Can you help me understand a bit about when you share back some of the results mm -hmm. with some of the citizen scientists? Have you gotten any feedback from them? How have they responded? Is it consistent with what they might report or more inconsistent? Absolutely. So um, the way we were structuring the keyboard, the, the dashboard, um, was inspired by Fibbit, and that's why I keep using a Fibbit as an example. Because um, instead of presenting the step counts, we are presenting how many key presses. It's almost like how many uh, steps your brain has taken for that day. And um, maybe backspace is like the uh, stepping backwards. <laughs> and then maybe the, the amount of uh, typos would be like side steps or something like that. So. Uh, we also have a mechanism for our citizen scientists to provide feedback by going into the app and there's a feedback tab. Um, and another thing that I have been really trying to do is that that's sort of one of the uh, PIs of the project. I myself is committed to using the app uh, ever since it was in the beta phase. So I've been using it for two years, more than two years, because I feel like if I'm the PI and I can't use the product that I'm making, then how can I convince our citizen scientists to be part of this together? So. Oh, thank you. So also, uh, you, you said that you're doing work in the clinic as well, seeing patients individually? Yes, I'm a psychiatrist. OK, so have, uh, have you seen any uh, patients on an individual basis using this uh, app and technology to like track their own moods? and? Have you used it in your clinical planning as far as medication changes and that sort of thing? Yes, so that's a great uh, question. And uh, my answer is going to be more nuanced because uh, ultimately, as far as I know, we are the first who came up with this uh, little crazy idea. So we're really building the knowledge base, building the science, the evidence for it. And there is always um, a conflict when, we see a pa when I see a patient as the researcher versus as the provider. Because you always want to make sure what you're recommending is evidence-based. And since we're just building the evidence right now, so in a way, I can't recommend it unless, uh, unless the patients, they somehow found this information by themselves on, on the internet. So I hope that answers your question. Hi there, thank you. Um, how do you take into account, or do you, how you might be typing at a different speed when you're writing an email versus texting someone? And have you thought about emojis at all and how that might be an indicator? 
Absolutely. So uh, we have iterated this our design of our keyboard for you know quite a few years now, and certain things are more um, limitations of iOS. For example, um, we would like to know whether they're using the keyboard when they're typing an email versus uh, they are posting on social media versus they are searching for information on Google because as you were saying earlier, this can be context sensitive. However, we are also limited by the fact that if you are working within iOS, then there are certain things you can't access because of the security features of iOS. That being said, it doesn't necessarily mean we can't build um, machine learning models to infer what we think the users, the users are likely doing with the keyboard. For example, something I didn't talk about was that in order for us to really properly model typing speed, we have to know if they're typing with one hand or two hands, right? Because I know for a fact if I'm typing with two hands, which is my default typing mode, I am going to be typing much, much faster than say when I'm driving and texting, <laughs> which I probably shouldn't do. But I guess, you know, to some extent, we all do a little bit. Um, but we actually found a way to infer, not with 100% accuracy for sure, but we found a, a way to reasonably guess uh, what kind of typing mode the person is engaged in at that point. One last question. Thank you for the talk. Um, so you spoke about how some of the features that you were collecting, say, the uh, IKD was predictive of uh, the mood. Uh, can you talk about what, what's the false positive rate and if any sort of longitudinal data is used to correct for that? Yeah, so I can't tell you the numbers off the top of my head, uh, but we have, you know, again, uh, fortunate to publish quite a few papers, including one in KDD, uh, and I can definitely share that with you. Uh, again, this kind of heterogeneous data, uh, multi-data data streams, uh, is really new to us. And so it's really a great for me to present and talk about the kind of data we have because we definitely appreciate feedback and also we are always looking for collaborators. So thank you for the time. Thank you very much.